What's up, guys? Hey, Jay, everyone else? Yep, the guy from last night, the former Muslim, has some questions. But first John 5 or 7. But guys, can you say a prayer in your hearts for me? Stephen, I asked people to pray for Stephen Universe. He said he's got COVID-19. So pray for him. Now, guys, could you pray for me? That the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and his infinite love compassion will, first of all, cleanse us, cleanse me, that will be washed in the holy blood of Jesus Christ. That the Lord Jesus will crucify our flesh and forgive us for our imperfections. Please, Lord Jesus, Son of God, save us from our flesh and forgive us when we succumb. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit to live in union with the Spirit, to glorify you, Son of God, the Son of the Father. Cleanse us and purify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, your blood, Lord Jesus. Cleanse our loved ones, my daughters, and your precious holy blood, the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, and fill us with the Spirit. And Lord Jesus, please for your glory, for your honor and praise, constrain me not to shame you, not to embarrass your name, Lord Jesus, and not to cause anyone to stumble and bless this young man who left Islam. Fill me with the Spirit to show him love and answer his questions by the power of the Holy Spirit. Rebuke Satan and attacks of Satan. Please, Lord Jesus, shield us from the evil one and shield that young man in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Please, Son of God, we love you. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Bless this session please holy spirit anoint me to recall facts and scriptures and interpret them correctly save me from error and stammering please i trust in you and i yield to you holy spirit we yield to you and we give this man to you holy spirit save him from the lies of satan in jesus almighty name yahovah father son of spirit yahovah father son of spirit yahovah rafa yahovah rafa yahovah rafa cleanse us in the jesus christ please father please Lord jesus please. pray because my success comes from the holy spirit Pray in Jesus' name. I don't shame the Lord Jesus Christ or cause this man to stumble. Please, I trust in you, my God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How you doing? So let's call him. See what I can do for him. Whew, I always get nervous, man, because I'm tired, guys. So I'm also tired. So a lot of sessions. <laughs> Hello, Sam. How are you, young brother? How are you, man? I'm doing good. How are you? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus, I'm doing good too. By His grace, trusting the Holy Spirit to fill us for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. Yeah, I'm sure. Hey. What's up, buddy? What's going on? Talk to me. Um, well, I first want to start by telling everybody because I told you over Skype, but I don't think anyone else knew that. But um, Today I listened to the Gospel of John and I really liked everything that was in it and I realized that we were taught a Jesus that was completely different from the real one and I felt like you know all those years of of thinking that I really knew who he was it just seems like I had not the slightest idea of who he really is. See glory to God as long as you yield to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit seals you and protects you he will cause you to fall more in love with jesus christ and have no doubt jesus christ is the son of god the lord of glory and he's the christ of the new testament so i'm trusting the holy spirit will now bless me to bless you so brother i'm here to see what i can do for you my friend what, what ask away whatever questions you have okay. I'll try to so so i had my so one of my questions was um i um, may I go? Yeah, go ahead. I'm listening to that, sorry. Okay. Um, the first question was about, uh, I don't know how to say it. Is it like First John? Is yes. that how you say it? We say the first epistle or the first letter of John, First John. So for short, we say okay. First John, Second John, Third John, First Corinthians. Okay. Because in Arabic, it's Risalat Yohanna. So That's right. I don't, I don't, okay, epistle. Okay. So it's 5 7. So, from what I un understood from what the guy was saying, is that um, it wasn't found anywhere in the old manuscripts. And then somebody just managed to sneak it in. And that basically created the Trinity, which I know is completely yeah. not true. So, I just thought I'd ask you to explain to me, you know, where he's lying. Let me just uh, repeat what you're saying so that people can understand he's talking about first john chapter 5 or 7 where there in the king james version and the new king james version as well as the modern english version and i also believe in the dewey reigns so i'm going to double check that 
and the Dewey Rames. I'm going to check it. Dewey Rames is a translation of the Latin version of the Bible. Because don't forget one thing. When the New Testament was written, it was originally written in Greek. Like you have the Quran written in Arabic. But when it was written, they made copies of it in different languages. So they would copy Matthew from Greek into Latin, from Greek into Syriac, Aramaic the mother tongue of my ancestors and other languages so you have about five thousand close to five thousand nine hundred copies of the 27 books of the new testament in the greek language that was written in. some would put the number a little less but it's around five thousand nine hundred we have about ten thousand copies of these books of the bible especially new testament about ten thousand in latin translated in latin and then when you count all the other languages, we have over 20,000 copies of the books in the Bible and all the various languages, Greek, Latin, what we call Coptic, Sahidic, right? Sahidic, uh, Syriac, Aramaic, Armenian, so on. So I just, when I talk about Dewey Rames, Dewey Rames is the English translation of the Latin. So in the West, the language became Latin. Like in the East, before Islam, brother, the language was Aramaic, Syriac, and then it became Arabic because of Islam, right? Yes. Okay, so don't forget that as Arabic becomes the dominant language in the East, the dominant language in the West is Latin. So they write in Latin. When they copy the Bible, it's in Latin. So they, they produced an English translation of the Latin version of the Bible, in the 1600s called the Dewey Rames. Now, let me just check before I answer. I just want to give you a little history, and I want to make sure everyone understands so I don't confuse anyone. I just want to double check if this version also has this. Uh, just, I want to be sh safe and sure so I don't misinform you and give you wrong information because I don't want to make mistakes. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to bless me, to speak truth, and to help you understand it for the glory of Jesus. So let me see. Dewey Rames. The Dewey Rames. Yep, it's in the Dewey Rames. So the Dewey Rames, the English translation Latin, this is what it says. And there are three who give testimony in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now this reading, and I'm helping the people to, who are listening so they can learn as well, because I want all of us to learn. This reading, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, you'll find it in the King James translation, the New King James translation, and you'll find it in modern English version. Now, in most other English translations, they don't have that verse. So now before I comment on that verse, what exactly were they saying in this program? Now, folks, he was hearing a program by Muslims attacking the Trinity, saying that this is the only verse that speaks about the Trinity, but it turns out to be a fabrication of forgery. So what did they say exactly? It, it was that it was it, it was only found in a Greek manuscript or a few Greek manuscripts that were of the 15th century and that was all he was showing a version in Arabic that had it yeah. had the text either in red yes. or in parentheses and then like underneath in the like in the, the like the lower part of the page it's it, it had like a little asterisk that said it's it's you know it said the history about it yes so he like was saying version. he was saying it's only in the 15th century 1400s and therefore, there is no Trinity because of that? Yes. Okay. Now, here's what happens when you deal with people who want to make another religion look very bad and, and corrupt. They will take facts, but they will explain the facts in a certain way to make it look very bad in order to cause you to never <clears throat> consider even studying that religion. Now, you and I both know that because the Bible and the Quran were copied by hand, during the copying process, you have copyists that make mistakes. That's just human nature. Whether we like it or not, the Quranic manuscripts, as you've found out and you've discovered, there are thousands of what they call variants, differences in the readings because of the qira'at and also mistakes. When a copyist makes a copy, he doesn't always copy correctly. Same thing we find in the Bible. So there are verses that you'll find in some manuscripts not found in others. Now, what he told you was partially true, meaning as far as all the Greek copies that we have of First John, because we don't have every copy of every book of the Bible ever written that's been preserved, because many of them 
were destroyed. Many of them, for example, uh, when Uthman, he ordered all the Quranic codices to be burned, right? They're gone. We yes. don't know what they read. Sometimes in time, when you have something, it wears out. It just, through age, it wears out. It becomes defective. It disappears. So as far as all the, ex the existing copies of 1 John, he did have a point. I'm going to read this note to you, okay? Now, this comes okay. from Christians who are Trinitarians, who believe the Bible is the Word of God and preserved. But I want you to understand how they present the facts from what the Muslim was saying, because the Muslim is trying to say, you see, no Trinity. They had to add this in the, in the manuscripts because they had to make up the Trinity because the Trinity is not on the Bible. Okay, now, let me just read this for you. This comes from the NET Bible, New English Translation Bible online, and has notes to help you understand the manuscript tradition as well as the meaning of verses. Even though this is their position, I'm going to give you another view, but I'm going to take this very slowly so you understand I don't confuse you. And if you're getting confused, say stop me. Say, Sam, I'm still not getting it. Okay? Okay. Okay, let's read. Now, they're talking about this reading. Now, here's what they say. This reading, the and it's called infinite, infamous, it has a name. Kama Yohaniyam, meaning the the Kama of John. Yohaniyam, that's the term they came up with. Has been known in the English-speaking world through the King James translation. Now, however... The evidence, both external, meaning the manuscripts that survive, and internal, meaning the context of that chapter. Now, they're going to tell you is decidedly against its authenticity. So they're saying it's not genuine. It wasn't part of what John wrote. Now, these are Christian Trinitarians. Now, let me call, continue. For a detailed discussion, they say read this book. Our discussion will briefly address the external evidence, meaning the manuscript evidence. How much manuscripts have this reading? This lo longer reading is found only in 10 late manuscripts. Okay, so late, only 10. Of all the copies of 1 John that have 1 John chapter 5, only 10 have this reading, and it's very late. Four of which have the words in a marginal note. Now, for those who don't know, marginal note means that they wrote it on the side. So if you have a book, you leave, your, you leave a note on the side of that book. That's called a marginal note, right? Or at the bottom, you know, if you have a if you have a book, you're writing, then you leave a note to the side of that page or at the bottom of the page. That's a marginal note. So so far, are you with me? Yes. Okay. okay I hope I'm not confusing you because I don't want to go too fast. So four of them yeah. have it as a marginal note. It's not even in the verse. It's a note on the side or on the bottom. These manuscripts range in date from the 10th century, meaning 900s, to the 18th century, 1700s. Okay. They include the following, and then it gives you the dates and the, the manuscripts. Now, the earliest manuscript, Codex number 221. Now, Codex is a mushaf. The word Codex in Arabic is mushaf. The earliest manuscript, okay. 221, includes the reading in a marginal note. So it's not even in a verse. It's on the note. It's a side note. Added sometime after the original writing. The oldest copy manuscript, mushaf, with the comma, in its text is from the 14th century, 1300s. That means 300 years after Christ. But the wording here departs from all other manuscripts in several places. So I'm just going to read the note. I want to get you information. I'll explain it. The next oldest manuscript of, of this passage is not comma number. It's, it's Mus'haf number 177 from the 11th century, meaning 1000. Okay. And then you have Mus'haf number 88. From the 12th century, that's 1100s. And then 429, 14th century, 1300s. And another Mus'haf number, 636, 15th century, meaning 1400s. Also have the reading only as a marginal note. Now, here's what they say, okay? The remaining manuscripts are from the 16th to 18th centuries, meaning 1500 to 1700 years after the birth of Christ, okay? Thus, there is no sure evidence of this reading in any Greek manuscript until the 14th century, until the 1300s. And that manuscript deviates, diff is different from all others in its wording. The wording that matches what is found in the King James Version and the Greek that the King James used was apparently composed after Erasmus's Greek New Testament in 1516. So they're saying that the King James got this from a printed Greek Mus'haf in the year 1516, 1516 years after the birth of Christ. 
Indeed, the comma appears in no Greek witness of any kind, either manuscript or quotation of the fathers or Greek translation until the year 1215, okay? This is all the more significant since many a Greek father would have loved such a reading for it so succinctly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity. So what they're saying basically is yes, this is very late. We don't have any early Greek copies that have it. So they believe it's not original. It was a note by a copyist and that note was taken to be part of the text and it was included. So what you heard from that Muslim is partially true in that what he was telling you is not something that he made up. It's something Christians have known, but the way he said it was to give the impression that this is the only verse that talks about the Trinity and they had to make it up because the Bible doesn't support the Trinity. Now, so far, are you with me? Before I yes, move on. that's exactly how he presented it. Yeah. Okay, but I just want to make sure because I want to present the facts. Now, that's the Greek copies. What you're not being told is you have Latin copies of the Bible. Remember I said that the Bible is translated in different languages very early, right? Mm -hmm. Like That's, yeah. the Greek books of the New Testament were translated in Syriac, Aramaic. They were translated in Sahidic, Coptic. They were translated in Latin. Now we have citations from church scholars, the ulama, church fathers, who are writing in Latin, and they claim that this reading is in their Latin copy. I'll give you one example. And I sent you the link to read. Okay? Yes. One of the clearest testimonies, even though there are some Christians who try to disagree and say, no, he's not referring to this, is a church father. When we call them father, we mean those whom God used to teach the truth, to defend the truth, and even die a shaheed for the truth. Cyprian, he, he's, he's writing around the year 210 to around 250 AD. So notice, 210 to 250 AD, this is 3rd century. So look how early he is. And he says in Latin, in his treatise, he says, the Lord says, I and the Father are one. That's John 10, 30. So he's quoting from his Latin copy of the Bible. And he says, the Lord, meaning Jesus says, I and the Father are one. That's John chapter 10, verse 30. And again, it is written of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So he's saying, it is written... Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these three are one. That is a reference to 1 John 5, 7 in Latin. You with me there? Yes, um, but the NLT version doesn't have one. Yes. It just says, so we have these three witnesses. Yes, because what I say about the modern English translations, they prioritize the Greek copies, meaning that they look to the Greek copies first. And when they see that the earliest copies don't have it, they don't include it, but they'll have it in a footnote. But that's what I'm saying. If you just go with the Greek, the earliest Greek copies that have 1 John 5, we don't find that verse. But if you don't limit yourself to the Greek and look at all the different versions and all the different languages of the books of the Bible, then you have evidence that's very early. For example, this Christian scholar, this Alam named Cyprian, I'll say Alam, okay? Cyprian. Okay. He's writing around 200s. That's 20 years after the birth of Christ. His Latin copy of John, 1 John has it. Now, here's the question. If this is a Latin copy, meaning it was translated from Greek, right? Yes. That means whatever Greek <clears throat> copy that was used to produce the Latin version, that Greek copy had that verse. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. So if he's quoting the Latin in around 200, his copy in Latin is older. It's earlier than 200, right? Right, yes. But then the copy from which it was translated from, the Greek, must be even older and earlier still. Yes, I'm following. So in other words, if you believe Cyprian is quoting the verse, and he's quoting it in a Latin copy. That Latin copy must have been a translation of a Greek copy that had it. So now you're pushing the evidence for this reading close to the time of Christ and his followers. 
You see? Yeah. Okay, now I gave you the link with this information. Now let me give you just another citation of this. This is in the year 380 AD. This is again, fourth century. This is way earlier than the Greek copies that have it. Remember, they're just talking about Greek copies, but they're not telling you about the Latin and other versions, right? Okay, so yes. Priscillian of Avila, Priscillian, his name is Priscillian of Avila, in the year 380, in his book, Liber Apologeticus, Liber Apologeticus, I believe it's volume one, and I believe it's section four. He quotes in Latin. I can't read the Latin for you because if I read it, you won't understand it. And he says, and as John says, there are three that give testimony in earth, the water, the flesh, and the blood. And these three are one. And there are three that give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one in Christ. So he's quoting what John wrote. And he's quoting this in the 4th century, 380 AD. And it's part of his Latin translation of Risala Yohannan, verse John. So what am I sh telling you? If you just go by the Greek copies, then yes, as I read from the NET, let me tell you well, one more time. Let me get there. The NET. Mm. Let me read it one more time so that we get this clearly. <clears throat> let me find the right section. Oh, sorry, you said NET. I was on yeah. NLT. No, no, NET, the a New okay. English Translation Bible in their notes. So let me just read that part again. Thus, there is no sure evidence of this reading in any Greek manuscript. Greek, notice, until the 14th century, meaning 1300s. Notice saying the Greek manuscript, right? Yes. But they didn't mention the Latin. Why? Because these scholars prefer... To look at the Greek because the original language of John is Greek. So if they see the Greek copies of John doesn't have it, then they ignore it. But here you have evidence that in the Latin copies, the Latin translation of the Greek, you find earlier evidence for it. But they don't like to look to the Latin because they like to prioritize the original language of the book. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that's bad. What I'm saying is if I just read what they're telling you about the Greek then you're going to think that it's only found in very late copies and there's no early evidence for it, right? But you have evidence yes. for it from at least 200s AD from Cyprian who's quoting it in his Latin Bible and on it goes. So it's not as <clears throat> black and white as they make it. Oh, there's nothing in the Greek till later. No, no, no. There's evidence for it much earlier in the latin translation are you with me there yes so there's a debate should we also look to the latin copies and also take that evidence into consideration and on the basis of the latin argue that it is part of john even though the greek copies of john may not have it because the earliest witnesses that do have first john 5 don't include it but still, we have earlier witnesses from the Latin stream, from Latin fathers, the ulama who are writing in Latin, and in their Latin Bibles. And we should then look to that as evidence and include it. See, that's the debate. That that's a debate among Christians. Okay. But we're not hiding the fact. In other words, the Muslim that you heard, he would not have known this if the Christian ulama didn't tell him. Who told him? The Christian ulama, the scholars. Why? Because we're honest with our manuscripts. We're honest with the facts of history. And we present the facts. Here are the facts. We don't hide them. Because if we hit them, none of the Muslim ulama scholars would know this. Right? Yeah, I see your point. There is there's some integrity. There's a lot of integrity there. Yes. So either way, we're the ones who are presenting the facts. We're not hiding it. We're the ones saying, here are the facts, here are the evidence, here are the manuscript <clears throat> tradition, here are all these copies of the Bible in all these languages. We have over 20,000 copies of the books of the Bible in different languages spread all over the world, showing that the original words that the original authors wrote by the Holy Spirit is there preserved because it would take a miracle. It would take a miracle for one person or a group of people to find every copy of every book of the Bible in every language and destroying them and only make copies that they wanted 
on the manuscripts that they chose, like Uthman did for the Quran. That has never happened in Christianity. Right? I see. So yeah. because that's never happened in Christianity, the copies of the books of the Bible were spread all over the world. They're being copied repeatedly in different languages, spread all over the world, making sure no one person or group, group of people could get a hold of all the copies to do with the Bible what Uthman did by gathering all the Qurans of the companions, Sahaba of, of Muhammad, and destroying them and saying, this is the Quran, I standardize, and we're going to make copies of that. That's never happened with our Bible, and thank God, because that, that shows that everything that the original writers wrote is there in all these copies because no one person could uh, get a hold of these copies and destroy these copies and only choose the copies he or she liked. You yeah, I see your point there. Okay, so yeah, what, that's, so that's, that's go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Oh, I was I was just gonna say that's that's a very different narrative from what what what, what was presented because uh, because right, you're right. There was nobody burnt all the manuscripts and then just said, "Here, look, perfect preservation." That's right. We don't do that. Any... Yeah. We didn't do that. So if yeah. he has a problem mm -hmm. with the fact that this reading is questionable, maybe a scribe added it to the manuscript stream. Okay, now. I would then ask the Muslim, what do you do with Uthman destroying the copies of Abdullah ibn Masud, Ubay ibn Kaab? And then what do you do with the fact that even Uthman's Quran, which was based on Zayd ibn Thabit, even that Quran, when he made copies of it, now we find that you have different qira'at, different Arabic versions, and they don't read exactly the same. And in the Hadith tradition, there are readings of the Quran that Abdullah ibn Masud's Quran had that Uthman omitted. And there were readings that Ubay ibn Kab had that Uthman omitted. So the hadith and the manuscript show that the Quran has thousands of readings and many verses that are missing because these verses were in the Mus'haf of Abdullah ibn Masud or in the Mus'haf of Ubay ibn Kab. But when Uthman destroyed them, those readings are not in your Quran today or any of the Qira'at, but they're mentioned in the Hadith by the people who had memorized those Qurans from Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Kaab. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. And I'm going to come back to 1 John 5 verse 7. I'm not done with it yet. Okay. If you open up the Abdullah Yusuf Ali Quran, if you have an Abdullah Yusuf Ali Quran, he has a note in the English. He has a note in the English of chapter 33 verse 6. Chapter 33, verse 6. There he says that in some of the qira'at, and this was in the, in the I'm sorry, in some of the masahif, I won't say qira'at because qira'at refers to the different Arabic versions of the mushaf of Uthman, the, the copy of Uthman. In some of the masahif, some of the copies of the Quran, such as Abdullah ibn Masood and others, it said, and his wives are your mothers and he is a father to you. He is a father to you. Muhammad is a father to you and his wives are your mothers. He's a father to them and his wives are their mothers. If you have your Quran, open up to chapter 33, verse 6. And I'm going to read it from Yusuf Ali. I'll show you the reading. But in your Arabic Quran, in 33, verse 6, what does it say about the wives of Muhammad? What are they? Um... Okay. So it does say they're mothers, right? But okay, wait. Now, logically, if they're their his their mothers, then what does that make Muhammad? Their father. That's why in the Masahif, the copies of Abdullah ibn Masud and others, there was a reading, and Muhammad is their father. Do you know that? Let me get it for you. Hold on, I'll prove it to you. Um, I, I, I found out about that very recently, yeah. So you know the reading is there, right? Yes. Here. Let me read this I, note. Well, I, I found yeah. out about that very, very recently, like in the, in the past week when all of this mess has come, came out with Masar Qadi and then, and then uh, the, person who, uh, the person who compiled all the list of the different readings and presented it. I, yeah. I've seen that. In fact, let me read this note. Here it is. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, it's in my article, I'll send you the link, page 1104, footnote 3674, and it's even mentioned by Muhammad Assad. 
who was a Jew who converted to Islam, and he translated the Quran in English called the Message of the Quran. Let me read what Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, right? In spiritual relationship, the Prophet is entitled to more respect and consideration than blood relations. The believers should follow him rather than their fathers or mothers or brothers where there is a conflict of duties. He is even nearer, closer to our real interests than our own selves. Now, now look what he says. In some qira'ats, like that of Ubay ibn Kab, this is Abdullah Safari saying it, occur also the words, and he is a father to them. His wives are their mothers, and he is a father to them. This was in the qira'at of Ubay ibn Kab, Abdullah ibn Masood. In fact, here, look at how many companions had this. Because according to Muhammad ibn uh, Muhammad Asad, it says some of them, Ibn Masood, Ubay ibn Kab, Ibn Abbas, Muawiyah, Muawiyah. When they recited it, they would say, he is a father to them. And also the Tabi'een, he says, Mujahid, uh, Katada, Ikrama, and Al-Hassan. They also had this in their reading. So did you catch it? Look how many people had this reading. Ibn Masood, Ubay ibn Kab, Ibn Abbas, Muawiyah. And among the Tabi'een, Mujahid, Katada, Ikrima, Al Hassan, they also had this reading, and he's a father to them. It was in their masahif and in their recitation. Why did Uthman get rid of it when Abdullah ibn Masood and Ubay ibn Kab were two of the four that Muhammad said learned the Quran from directly? You with me there? Mm -hmm. I see. Now, well, one of my yeah, and and yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Finish your point. Oh, I, I was just gonna say we are never we're, you know you don't really they don't tell you that they just you know you have to go look for it and find it now and, with that and, and, you know to go to uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali the, the, I don't think it is there like you know when you go just read it you don't have a footnote there now, it's you know in in in, the, in my version yeah of course it's the Arabic there but now my point is yeah which Muslim would say now because that reading is gone now notice it was a reading attested by the sahaba two of whom were the very two that muhammad said learned the quran from abdullah ibn masood and ubay ibn kab and yet it's not in the quran today you don't have it uthman didn't include it but in the ahadith and in the muslim sources they confirm this was in their masahif in their codices so now would that muslim tell you see the quran is corrupt because now you're missing a verse a verse that the companions of Muhammad learned directly from the mouth of Muhammad as part of the word of Allah, Kalam Allah, that they included because they knew it's Quran and now it's longer there. So now you have something of the Quran lost. Would that is that what the Muslim scholar would tell you? Would he say that to you? No, right? No, no, they would they would, you know, they would they, they, they take the roundabout way of, of explaining it and then they just sort of just hush it down afterwards. Now, let me tell you why I suspect some of them got rid of it. You know why I suspect some of them got rid of it? We're going to come back to First John. Don't think I'm not answering your question. Okay. I'm just trying to give you the history. I'm trying to yes. give you the context by which to honestly examine the manuscripts of the Bible and the Quran. Because if a Muslim tells me you have different readings in the manuscripts, and therefore the Bible has been changed, and we don't know what it says, then I'll say, okay, be fair. Stop being a Muslim. Because you have thousands of different readings in the Quran manuscripts, and even in the Ahadith, it says the Masahif, the copies of the Quran by the commands Muhammad did not agree. They also had readings that the others did not have. So then stop being a Muslim. You don't want to be Christian? Then be honest. Become atheist agnostic if that's your argument. But if you're going to say it's okay, even though there are variant readings, the Quran has still been preserved because we can still examine these readings to know what Muhammad originally said. Same thing with the Bible, and we have more manuscript support for the Bible for its accuracy because we have copies of the Bible in all these languages. But again, here's my reason. Here's my reason. The reason I think, and I sent you another article on this. Uh, so in your comment I section, you can read it yeah. later. Here's what I think why that reading was omitted. If you go with, and his wives are their mothers, and he is a father to them, 33 verse 6. Then in 33 verse 40, it says, Muhammad is not the father of any of you men. That's a contradiction. Are we talking about Zaid? No, just, no, 33 or, verse 40. It just says, the, Muhammad is not the okay. father of any of you men, right? Period. Yeah. But then in 33 verse 6 says, he's a father to them. 
So he's not the father of the mu'minun, or is he? Oh, I see. But I mean, didn't that come out for because of because of the Zaid incident, or is it not? Yeah, well, we, to exactly. Zaid? But even Zaid wasn't his biological son; he was adoptive son, right? Yeah, yeah, but right. even if you say Zayed is no longer his adopted son, but Muhammad is still his, his father because according to 336, he's your father. So when did okay, he stop being Zayed's father? Okay. I see. You get my point? In other words, it's a difficult... I, I my point is it's difficult. If you say he's he is a father to them, then he's a father to Zayed. But then you say he's not the father of any of you men. He's not the father of Zayed. Okay, but he was never Zayed's biological father. He was Zayed's adoptive father. So now, does he stop being Zayed's father altogether? Because in verse 6 it says, he's still his father in one sense. He is the father of all the Muslim men. But here it says, he's the father of none of them. So make up your mind, Allah. What is he? I see. Do you see the problem it creates this reading with 33 verse 40? Yes, and also I, I also recently found out about the verse that a chicken ate or a goat ate. I mean, the I, goat I, I, ate, the goat ate, the yeah. In, 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 the hadith in Arabic says, which I think dajin means chicken. Yeah, it can mean that, it can just mean, yeah, like a beast, but sheep. Yeah, exactly. So the point is, sorry, okay. I have to, I spoke. The point is, if this guy wants to attack the Bible because of it, he has to stop being a Muslim. And then I'll say, okay, you're being honest. You're not a Muslim, you're not a Christian because of the very meaning. It's like Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman stopped being a Christian because of all these different differences in the manuscripts. That's why he'll never be a Muslim because he knows even the Quran has differences in the manuscripts. But now let's put that aside. Now that we gave, gave you all these facts, still, even if I agree, 1 John 5, 7 is not part of the Bible, Christians did not come up with the Trinity because of 1 John 5, 7. Are you with me there? Yes, I mean, the Council of Nicaea was a long time before the 15th yes. century anyways, right? And even before Nicaea, we have the writings of ulema, ulema like Ignatius. Igni I'll tell you who Ignatius is. He's a tabi. You know how you have the tabiun, the, the disciples? Yeah, of, tabi. Yeah, so he was a tabi. He was the disciple of the Apostle John. Of a disciple of, okay. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. He knew the, the Apostles. He met them, they taught him, they appointed him, and you'll find in his writings, he wrote seven letters around 107 AD, 107 AD. He's going to Rome to be killed, to be eaten by the lions. He's going to be a shaheed for Jesus. He's going to be a martyr for Jesus. And I have an article where I quote him. I'm going to give that to you too. There you're going to see okay. in his letters, he's saying, Jesus is the God who became a man being born of the virgin the Son of God who is with the Father before creation in eternity, our God, Jesus, Jesus, our God, who shed his blood. That's what he's saying. And this is a tabi, a disciple yeah. of the Sahaba of Jesus. Okay? So put First John 5, 7 yes. aside. Whether you accept it or not, the Trinity does not depend on First John 5, 7. And I'm going to show you the inconsistency of the Muslim. Here's what you tell the Muslim, saying, you're saying... 1 John 5, 7, if it's true, it proves the Trinity. They'll say yes. If it's true, it proves the Trinity. And you say why? Because it says the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, these three are one. Okay. So by saying they are one, that means they're one God, right? That's the argument, right? See, it says they're one, meaning one God, right? Yes. Okay. So then not, this is where you catch them saying, okay. So in John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And there is no doubt this is part of the original Gospel of John. It's there. It's in all the manuscripts. So we know this is what John wrote. So now do you agree Jesus saying, I and my Father are one God? Oh, they look, they look at that and they say, oh, no, it is symbolic. It's not in the way that they twist it to make it look like they're equal. It's just to say that, oh, oh. I'm, I'm a messenger and that's, oh, but did that's you catch my it? message and that's his message. Oh, but notice. But I, I see your logic, yeah. Yeah, but notice what they're doing. That's what I want you to catch. Oh, okay, I see. But when First John 5, 7 says these three are one, you're saying it would prove that they're one God if it's true. But because you think it's not true, you can say, yeah, see, it proves the Trinity, but John didn't write it. It's it's a lie. It's a forgery. 
But when John 10, 30 says, I am my father and one, and you cannot say it's a lie, it was added, because the, it's clearly John wrote it. Now you explain it away. Now you say, well, it doesn't mean one God. In other words, if I did prove to them, if I did prove to them, 1 John 5, 7 was true, they would still say, well, it doesn't mean one God. It means they're one in unity. Yeah. You get it now? Yes, I do. That Yes, yes, I do. When they can't play that game with John 10, 30, they can't say, well, see, a scribe added it. It's not in the copies of John before 1400. And yeah, if it was true, then Jesus saying one God. Because they can't say that they know this is what John wrote. It's part of the original gospel that John wrote. And Jesus did say that, according to John. They can't say, well, it's added. Now they have to explain it away. Well, yeah, he did say the one, but means one in purpose. So, but then why is it in 1 John 5, 7, when it says the three are one, there it means one God. But here when Jesus says, I am the Father one, it doesn't mean one God. Why are you changing your argument and changing your point? Yeah, the goalpost keeps moving you get all it. the time. Yeah. Ah. I do. Okay, so with 1 John 5, 7, I myself personally, I believe it's genuine. But I don't make it a big deal and I don't use it. And, and, and none of my debates... None of my discussions I use for John 5, 7. I have my reasons for accepting it's genuine. But there are other, other Christians who are scholars, who are more learned than me, who disagree with me. And that's fine because 1 John 5, 7 is not a text I turn to to prove the Trinity. But John 10, 30 does prove Jesus and the Father are one God. Jesus is not the Father, but he is one with the Father in his power. Because both Father and Son are God. Now, I can show you that if you're interested. If that's up to you. Unless you have another question. As in, as in the, 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 like, you're talking about John 10.30. The, the John 10, 30. Yeah, in other oh, words. I've, I've, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, so you see how it proves that he's God, right? Yes, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, that it's not just simply I am the Father one. It's in the context of what he says that shows. He's saying, I'm one with the Father in, in our power to... Give life and preserve all believers, something only God can do. That's that's the context. So it's not just I am the Father one. It's 2730. But anyway, if do you have any other questions on first John 5 7? More clarification? This is your no, time to ask. No, I, I that that makes that makes that it makes sense to me. All right. So first John 5 7 is not one passage that you turn to to prove the Trinity. So I do believe it's uh, genuine. Other Christians more learned than me don't, but <clears throat> Whether they do or not, I still don't use it to prove the Trinity. I don't. Because in, in that context, when it says they are one, if you read it, there the context is they are one in their witness. So it's not saying the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit are one God, one in their that, their essence. It's saying they are one in yeah. their witness because it's talking about the Shaheed. It's talking about the witness of God. God has borne witness. God has testified that Jesus is his son and life is in his son. And if you want to live, you have to believe in his son. So the father bears witness that Jesus is the son who gives life. The son has borne witness that he is God's son who gives life. And the spirit bears witness. So these three are one in their witness. That's what it's saying. So in that context, it's not one God. It's one in their witness. Just read it. If you read it from verse 6 all the way down, to 12, it's about the testimony, the shahada, Allah's shahada, God's witness of who Jesus is. And what does God say? This is my son, and life is in my son. And if you want life, you have to believe in his name. And if you say he's not my son, you're saying I'm a liar because I've borne witness he is my son. Look at it. You'll see. I see it. it. You see in the context for John 5, 6, to I see 12? It. I see it. It's the shahada, yes. Okay. But that means Muhammad is making God a liar. Because God is saying, I bear witness, Jesus is the Son, and life is in him, and you have to believe in the name of my Son to have life. Muhammad says, Allah is not the Father, and Jesus is not his Son. So according to John, Muhammad is saying that Allah lied when he said, he is the Son, and life is in him, and you have to believe in my Son to have life. So which is the true shahada, according to John? It, it, it is that uh, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the ones that bear witness to? To Jesus being who? Uh, Rasul or Ibn Allah? Allah being the Son. 
So they bear witness that he is what? The son of God and life is in him, right? Yes. yes. But Muhammad said, I deny that witness because the witness is Jesus is not the son of God. And God says, no, the true witness is he is my son. Life is in him. And the spirit bears witness with me. This is my son. Life in his, is, is in him. And Jesus himself said, I am the son and you must come to me to have life. Yes, and yeah, and, and it also says, and in, in, in that who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's I mean, right. I'm translating it from Arabic. And then it says, if you deny the witness of God, that Jesus' Son, you make God a liar, right? Yes. So Muhammad is saying, God is a Dajjal, he lied? That's what John is saying. I see. And then not only yes, that, I see that, go to 1 John 2, 22 to 23. 1 John 2, 22 to 23. According to John, you know Muhammad is Al Masih Al Dajjal. He's the Dajjal. He's the Antichrist. Oh, I see it. Twenty-two. I see it. What does it say in First John chapter two, verse twenty-two to twenty-three? What does it say? If you do not says, have the Father and Son, what are you? You are an Antichrist or the Antichrist. I'm not sure if yeah, it's an the Antichrist. RN. There are many. There were many. John says in First John two eighteen, okay. many Antichrists will come in the world. So according to John. If you say God is not the Father, Jesus is not the Son, you say God is a liar when he bore witness that Jesus is the Son and life is in him, and you are an antichrist. So Muhammad says Allah is not the Father, he says not the Son, so he is an antichrist who is accusing God of lying. I see that. I see what you're saying, yeah. Okay, so why would a Muslim want to quote this book to try to prove Christianity, the Trinity is false when it proves that Muhammad is false and the Quran is a lie. I don't really think they know the context behind any of the books. I think many of them just they all they all use the works of the, the ones that came before them and they use these verses and they just they just read off the same thing. All right, see? So now because you know I'm Arabic and you know Arabic, I want you to look at some verses in the Quran. And if you have questions about John, ask me. It's just your time. But I want to show because we're talking about Shahada. Now, you know, yeah, okay. the Quran, when it was written, there was no tashkil. There was no diacritical markings, right? There was no tashkil, yes. Yeah, there wasn't where it makes it accusative, nominative, etc., right? So I want you to go to yes. chapter 3 of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 18. I want you to read and imagine it without tashkil, without the markings. Here you're going to have a very big mistake in the Quran because it says, Allah bears witness, there is no God but Him. And the angels and those possessed of knowledge. Oh yeah, I see it. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illa huwa wal malaika tu ulul almi qa'iman bil qist. La ilaha illa huwa al aziz al hakim. You want me to how to read it without? If you read the, without tashkil, it, it, it reads, Allah bears witness. There is no god but He and the angels and those possessed of not knowledge. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You see how silly it is. So that means. Muslims had to come and improve on the language of Allah because the Quran is supposed to be perfect. And yet the way the Quran is structured without tashkil, without these markings, you got Allah bearing witness that he, the angels, and those possessed of knowledge are all God, which is a gross mistake. But that just tells you that the Arabic of the Quran is not perfect and it's not miraculous. It's actually quite silly. And there's another verse that says in 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 uh, it's like the in Allah and I forgot it's like yeah. when we're like the the, the tashkil mark changes yeah. it from the scholars fear Allah or the Allah fears the scholars. Exactly. And let me give you one where again without tashkil you're gonna have the Quran saying you are supposed to only take Allah and Messiah as your Lord. Go to Surah Al Tawbah, Surah Al Tawbah, chapter okay. nine. And I want you to read verse 31, ayah 31, chapter 9 of the Quran, verse 31. Without tashkil, without the diacritical marks, it says, they, they took their rabbis and monks as lords besides Allah and the Messiah, son of Mary. Meaning you're only supposed to take Allah and the Messiah, son of Mary, as your lord. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I do speak Arabic, but I'm trying to understand. So... I don't, I mean, if you stop there, then that's... If you remove the tashkil, it's, it's, they, they took their rabbis and monks as lords besides Allah and the Messiah, son of Mary. When in reality, what the author seemed to have tried to say was they took as, 
as their Lord, or the rabbis, the monks, and the Messiah instead of Allah. But he ended up saying they took their rabbis and monks as lords instead of besides Allah and the Messiah. So what, 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 which part is the part that you're talking about in the tashkil? Okay, now mm. notice how they dotted al Messiah, son of Mary, the Messiah, son of Mary. I don't have it in front of me, but you'll see there. They tried to, dotted as in. they made it where they made Messiah part of the rabbis and the monks and not with Allah in the dotting, right? The tashkil? I got it. Al-Masiha. Right? Yes, yes. So I that, see. that the, but if you don't have the tashkil, it doesn't say that. It says you they took the rabbis and the monks as lords besides Allah and the Messiah, son of Mary. Yeah, I see that. Okay. What is my point? Messiah, yeah. This again shows you the Quran is not the perfect Quran and perfect Arabic because the way it's written. You have the author of the Quran making so many mistakes, introducing so many partners with Allah and so many gods with Allah. So again, that's just to show you the reason why this came up is because notice the difference. In First John, God bears witness, he's a shaheed, that the Messiah is his son and life is in his name and you have to believe in the son to have life. Here in the Quran you have Allah bearing witness, there is no God but he. But even then he, he butchers it because he ends up saying, Allah bears witness, there is no God but He and the angels and those possessed of knowledge, right? Yes. So, so even the witness of Allah in the Quran is mixed up, it's garbled, it's confusion. Confusion. Because the Quran wanted to say that Allah bears witness, there is no God but He, and the angels and those possessed of knowledge agree there is no God but He, but He comes out saying, Allah bears witness, there is no God but He and the angels and those possessed of knowledge. Well, couldn't you make a, a similar argument with Hebrew since it all doesn't have tashkil in the writing? Oh, because in Hebrew, well, even oh, in the Old Testament, I'm sorry. Yeah, but in what, yeah. what passage can you point to in the Hebrew Continental Text where without the markings, it's going to give you a different theology and change the nature of God? I see. I, I, was, I didn't have a verse in mind. I was yeah, just, that's what I'm saying. Know, so that's my that point. I'm saying I'm giving you actual examples. It's not theoretical. I'm not giving you theory. You see, there's a difference. You can say, well, yes. without the markings, the continental text can say anything. I gave you actual examples that without the markings, the theology changes. Yeah. It's bad theology because without the markings, it's Allah bears witness. There is no God but he and the angels and those who possess knowledge, right? Men of learning. Yes, yes. Okay. That's bad theology, Quranically speaking, because that's not true. Angels and men of learning, men of knowledge, those who have knowledge, are not an ilah with Allah. So the way it's structured, the consonantal text, it's embarrassing. Or the consonantal text of chapter 9, verse 31, is, is embarrassing because you end up having... Allah is saying, you should not have taken rabbis and monks as lords besides me and the Messiah. You should have stuck with me and the Messiah. I see. So the verse that I was that I was referring to, it's in Surah, I think it's Surah Fatir, verse 28. Oh, which is, yeah. So the way that the shkil is makes it so that the scholars are the ones that fear Allah. But if you read it without the shkil, then it it, it reads as Allah is scared of the See? scholars or Allah fears the scholars. How can that be if the Quran is supposedly the perfect speech of Allah and Allah knows everything and he speaks perfectly and it's perfectly preserved? Why is it, why is it composed in such a way that you make such gross mistakes? Is Allah that bad of a communicator that he speaks like an imperfect man like Muhammad? Yeah, I see your point. And I also just found out about the stoning verse that was abrogated, but it was abrogated and then like, and, and it was just, it just went away. So that yeah, also is... That was the sheep that ate it, but the, also the, the breastfeeding of, of grown men. The breastfeeding. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yes, hilarious. So. I want to give one more example from the Quran, then we can come back to okay. the Bible. We'll keep it on the Bible. I was just brought it up to show you. Okay. The Muslims live in glass okay. houses. They shouldn't be throwing stones at me. But here's another one that's beautiful. I love this. If you go to Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 106. Chapter 2, verse 106, Surat al-Baqarah. Okay. Okay. 
سيس أسي يا ما ننسخ من آية أو ننسي هنا أتي بخير منها أو مثلها ألم تعلم أن الله على كل شيء قدير Okay now Just about abrogation Now I want to what I want to bring out something interesting Watch it let me get it first because certain translations don't Certain translations don't translate it properly. Here, let me show you. Let me just get it. 2106 for everyone who doesn't know the Arabic. Chapter 2, verse 106. It says, uh, whatever a verse, whatever a verse do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring a better one or similar to it, right? Yes. Okay, now let me ask you a question. All the ayat, the ayat are supposed to be kalam Allah, the speech of Allah, right? The Quran is a speech of Allah. Yes. All of it, right? In the Lawh al Yeah, so so can I ask you something? How can some verses be better than others? Does that mean that certain parts of Allah's speech is superior to other parts of Allah's speech so that in certain places Allah speaks better than he did previously? I see your question. Because yeah, it says... I couldn't answer it. <laughs> no, because think about what it said. Because whenever we abrogate, cancel out a verse, we bring a verse better a or better similar to it. Are the same, yeah. How do you bring a better verse from a Quranic verse when all the verses of the Quran are the speech of Allah, Kalam Allah, and I thought Allah's speech is perfect and equal, and that Allah doesn't speak better in some places than in other places? Does that mean Allah's speech improves? I see. I wonder what what they say to that, but. But it's 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 a little you know it's it's very weird to me when I'm studying this because I see things that look like grammatical errors, and then I I say well did, don't you claim of the linguistic miracles, and then they say well see the the grammar is based on the Quran so you can't be wrong if the grammar is based on it, and then they say scientific miracles, and then you you point it out, and then they say science is always changing, brother. Yeah, and then you tell and them you hold never on. Know. But you say okay, hold on, but if if. The, uh, the grammar is based on the Quran, then how can I know that the Quran is a miracle if I don't have a standard of Arabic to judge the Quran by? Yeah, I, I came to that conclusion and then I realized that it just was all very meaningless talk of, of just hyping it up and just saying it's, it's so wonderful and it's so great. Well, you know, if I read Shakespeare, I probably couldn't understand it. That doesn't mean that Shakespeare's the plays are any divine yeah. just because it's being spoken in some complicated language but even for shakespeare it being a standard shakespeare is is being written in a language that predates the right in other words shakespeare didn't simply make up a language it's it's written yeah. in a language that's already known already studied and dissected so when someone tells me the quran is an arabic linguistic miracle well i must know the ling linguistic rules, the rules of Arabic language to then know that it's a miracle or not. But then you're telling me, no, Arabic grammar is the result of the Quran, so you can't use Arabic grammar to judge the Quran. Then how can I use Arabic grammar to judge the Quran as a miracle? Exactly, exactly. Too many problems. But ask me questions about the Bible. I prefer to talk about that if you have any okay. questions. Okay. Go ahead, ask me. I'm going to get some okay. water. I, I prefer to ask about yes, that. Okay, I'll wait for you. I'm here. No, I'm listening, so I'm not too far. Okay, okay. So in the Gospel of John, I forgot exactly what verse, but it was when Jesus came back and, and Mary Magdalene saw him. And then he said that I'm going back to my father and John your father 20, and my God and your God. John but then 20, like a little bit after that, she said, uh, I, you know, she, she refers to him as the Lord. Yes. John 20, verse 17. Uh, Jesus says, stop clinging to me. For I have yet to ascend to my father. But go to my brothers and say, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now, do you want me to answer why he could say the father is his God? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. First of all, when you look at the Arabic, pay attention to the wording carefully. He says, go to my brothers. Okay. So he's saying they're my okay, brothers. Okay, let me right? go back to the Yeah, Arabic. go to John 20, verse 17. Okay. John 20, verse 17. 17 okay yeah. if you go there again it says stop clinging to me stop holding me stop you know mm. uh, let go yeah. in other words and and go to my, I have yet to ascend to my father I have yet to go to heaven to be with my father then he says but go tell my brethren my brothers I'm ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God so first thing I want you to pay attention to he says go to my brothers 
meaning the disciples. Now, in what yes. way could Jesus say that the disciples are his brothers if he's not human? So he's obviously human, right? Yes. My brothers, meaning they are of my family. We're the same family. My brothers, because Jesus is also human, and he comes to make them children of God. And because he's human, he is their oldest brother. It's just like the oldest brother. Okay, so number one, my brothers, because Jesus is still a man. He's still a man. That's why she's touching a body. What is she touching? She's touching his body, that physical body that he right. raised from the dead. Okay, so don't forget he's a man. First of all, he's a man. But even the way he speaks of his relationship to God, it's unique. Notice he didn't say, go tell my brothers I'm ascending to our Father and our God. Why does he make a distinction and make it longer? His, he makes his speech longer by saying, says, Abi, Abi, yes. yeah, my Father, your Father, my God. Why not just say our Father and our God? Why does he have to em emphasize my Father and your Father, my God and your God? Because the relationship of Jesus with the Father is different and unique from our relationship. Even though we are children of God, God is our Father, we are his children because of creation. He created, give us life, and we are children because of Jesus, his grace in saving us to make us part of his family. So there is a unique relationship that Jesus has with the Father that's different from our relationship, and he's emphasizing it. He's my Father, and he's your father, my God, and he's your God. So let me explain what he's trying to say here. The okay. father is our God by virtue of being our creator. He created us, right? And yes. also in one sense, because he created us and give, gave us life, he's our father in that sense. Meaning, what does a father do? Well, your father gave you life by the permission of Allah. And because your life came from your father and mother, he's your father, she's your mother. So he gives you life and he provides for you. So in one sense, God is the father of all creation. And I have to really explain this and break this down so I don't confuse anyone. Because why? He gives life to all creation, right? And he provides for all creation. So in that sense, he's a father, right? He's a father. So yes. God is their God by nature. Meaning if you're a creature, God created you. So he's your God. But the father is Jesus' God, not so much because Jesus is a creature by nature. It's because Jesus became part of creation when he became insan, when he became flesh. Yes. He wasn't always flesh. He wasn't always flesh. Because in John 1, 14, it says the word became flesh, right? Yes. Okay. So according to the story of the Bible, the eternal word, Karimat Allah, became flesh when he becomes flesh when he enters the world to become a man to take on a human flesh from the womb of his blessed mother that's when the father becomes his god okay now let me show you by giving you a verse in the bible go to jeremiah 32 27 Jeremiah, jeremiah 32 27 20 i'm sorry 22 Jeremiah 32, chapter 32, verse 27. Okay, 32, 27. Okay. okay. Jeremiah 32, verse 27. If you read it in Arabic, you'll see it says that he is Yahweh. I am Yahweh. That's but I think it says Rab in the Arabic. Your Arabic. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, right? Is there anything hard for too hard for yes. me? So yes. he is the God of what? All flesh. Kul, kul bashar, which okay. is just all humans. So if Jesus became flesh and the Father didn't become flesh, should it surprise us that when Jesus becomes flesh, the Father becomes his God? I see. You see the point? I do. I do see the point. Make the connection. Jesus is the word of the Father who then becomes flesh. And if the Father doesn't become flesh, but Jesus becomes flesh, now there's a sense in which the Father becomes his God because Jesus becomes flesh and takes on the nature of man. By taking that nature, he makes his Father his God. 
I see. And after the resurrection, is Jesus still flesh? I, I think so. Of course. I, 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 what was he touching so. in John 20, 17, this after the resurrection? Yeah, it was, it was like the, the flesh, the body. So if he's still flesh uh, with a physical body, will the Father stop being his God? No. And just to prove to you that he's still flesh, in that same chapter, John 20, read verses 24 to 27. John 20, one second. The same chapter in John 20, verse 17. If you just go a little later, you go to John 20, read 24 to 27. Hold on, let's see what I got. What, what chapter were we in? We're in John chapter 20, the Gospel of John. In 20, John, okay. Chapter 20. And in what verse? Read from 24 to 27. When they told Thomas, when you go there, they told Tuma, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Yeah, Tuma. Okay, we've seen the Lord, right? Yeah, and then he said, I won't believe it until I see the place where the nails were the placed. Or yes, exactly. Uh, unless I touch the holes of the nails in his hands and also to touch the side, I won't believe. But wait, if you pay attention, Thomas is asking to touch that physical body that was crucified. Because if Jesus wasn't alive in that physical body, why is he asking I have to see the holes in his hands and the hole in his side from the crucifixion if he didn't still have his physical body after he was raised. Then, uh, yeah, then, they, then he would be, he would have his body. So when he had his body after the resurrection, was it like, was it all bloody and all that? Or was no, it? No, it's not, not bloody. No. no blood. Okay. But you get it? It's no blood. But he still do, has I that do, physical yes. body, right? Yes. Okay. So that means he's still a man. In San, he's still a man, and as a man, he still has a physical body, right? Yes. So but now it's a physical Jeremiah, body. Then it would... But now it's a physical body that cannot die anymore. The difference is, after the resurrection, that physical body cannot die anymore. You cannot hurt it. You cannot destroy it. You cannot put it to death. And I don't mean to use this as an example. It's a bad example. But it's like Superman. When you shoot Superman, bullets do nothing to him. If you stab on a knife, nothing, right? Yeah, that's what happens to the body when it's raised. So when you are raised with Jesus, your physical body, now it can die. It can be hurt. You can cut it. But when God raises that physical body, it's indestructible. It cannot die. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be harmed. That's the kind of physical body you're going to have. The same physical body Jesus has now that he's raised that physical body. Okay, I see. I see. Okay, are you, you understand the point or am I confusing you? I, I do. No, I do. I do. Further proof that Jesus has a physical body. It's flesh. Okay? okay go to Luke 24, verse 39. Mm -hmm. Luke 24, 24, verse 39. Verse 39. 29? Yeah, Luke 24, 29. verse 39. Jesus appears to them again on that first resurrection Sunday. He appears to them. They think they're seeing a spirit, and he says, Come and touch me. Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. Luke 24, 39. I read it, yes. 39. So what does Jesus have? Flesh and bones. A physical body. Right? Yes. Doesn't mean he didn't die. It means he died, but when he raised to life, Re resurrection means to take that physical body that was dead and make it alive again. How do I know that this is Jesus' physical body raised from the dead? Same chapter again. Same chapter, Jesus speaking. Read Luke 24, 46. Verse 46. Okay, I, I, I did read it, but where it says, does that... It says, and on the body? third day, he will rise from what? From the dead. So here Jesus is saying, see, it's the third day, and I've been raised from the dead. But now that he's been raised from the dead, he's been raised from the dead with a body of flesh and bones. Because that's Jesus okay. speaking. Jesus speaking right after telling yeah. them, touch me and see... A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. And he goes, and don't be surprised. Didn't the prophet say 
I, the Messiah, al Messi is going to suffer and be raised on the third day? Well, I've been raised on the third day. It's me. Why are you shocked? I told you this. I told you the prophets. That's what they said. Why did you doubt? It's me. Raised from the dead in that body that they nailed, flesh and bones. Okay, I see. This This reminds me of when I was listening to the the gospel. There was a part where uh, Jesus was saying, um, the, the, according to the Sharia at Musa, I guess that means the law of Moses, aren't you all gods? Yeah, so that's I it. Don't, I well, it means uh, it's, it's uh, Dawood. It's not even Dawood, but it's the Zabur. He's quoting the Zabur. He calls it okay. the law. Yeah, John 10, 35. Okay. okay. But what you want, I can answer that one too. But what I want you to see so far, though, I'll go to John. I'll explain what he means there. But what I okay. want you to catch is, is Jesus still a man with a physical body, a body of flesh and bone after the resurrection? Yes. So the, now after all of that is done, does he remain to be that yes. until now or did Forever. that change? Forever. Okay. He's got a body that's physical that cannot die. It's deathless. Why do you think in heaven, okay. in heaven, now in heaven, look what he told John. Same John, if you go to Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, go to the last book of the New Testament. Revelation That's 22. written by the same John? Yeah, John, John who wrote the gospel oh, and the Risala. That was a different John. No, no, history says, remember the Tabi'in, the, the disciples yeah. of the apostles say, the same John who wrote the gospel and the letters wrote Revelation. Okay. So okay. which chapter in verse? The last chapter, Revelation 22, verse 16. The last chapter, Jesus speaking in heaven. He's now in heaven. Now this is years after his resurrection. Years after he's gone to heaven. Look what he says to John. He says to him, I, Jesus, Revelation 22, last chapter, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to the churches, right? Now notice what he says. Yes. I am the bright and morning star. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I am the root. I am the root and offspring of Dawood, Nabi Dawood. I am right now. Yes, uh, Dawood wa Nasluh. Yeah, but he's saying now I am a Nasluh. son of David. Now I'm from the house of David. How? How can he be from the house of David if he's not still a human being? I see. So what is he in heaven? He is a Yahudi. He is a Jew. From the house of David because he's still a man. Yes. Clear? Yes, that is yeah, yes. Clear. Okay, so if it's clear, follow me. The father didn't become flesh, but he sent his word, his kalam, to become flesh. When the word became flesh, he became Jesus of Nazareth. That's his name. Because he became flesh, the father becomes his God, because the father is the God of all flesh. Because he's still flesh, he's still man, and he'll never stop being man, he'll never stop being flesh, the Father will always be his God. But you understand what that means, right? Um, so, sort of, but then that, that also doesn't take from the fact that he, is, he isn't limited to what a mere human can do. Well, right? that's remember, we believe Christ has two natures. As a man, a physical yeah. body, like on earth, in his physical body, as a man, in his physical body, he was limited to time and space. So that means he'll be in your house physically, but he can't be in two houses at the same time in his physical body, right? Yes. But as God... That's a different story. As God, he's not limited. So here is the word who now takes to himself a human nature, a physical body. But as the word who's united to the Father, he sees all creation and he's sustaining, giving life to it. While on earth, in that physical body, in that physical body, he's only at one place at one time. Now I'm going to prove that to you. Are you ready? Yes. I'm going to prove to you that Jesus physically can be standing before you. And in that physical body, stand before you in, in a place at a certain time. And in that physical body can only be at one place at one time. But while he's looking at you, being God, the Word, who is united to the Father, he can see all creation. And he's watching over all creation and he's sustaining all creation. Even though in his physical body, that physical body is only at one place at one time. Let me, let me prove it to you. Ready? Okay, yes. When the woman comes to Jesus and says to him, 
My daughter is demon possessed. Come and heal her. Read Mark 7, 29 to 30. Mark 7, 29 to 30. Mark 7, 29 to 30. What does he say to her in Mark 7, 29? I'm going to get there. Um, go and, and says that the, 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 he's expelled the devil out of her, out of her daughter. daughter. And then in verse 30, she goes and finds out that the, the demon had left, right? Yes. But Jesus was the one who cast out the demon. She came to him saying, cast them out. How could Jesus cast out a demon? When he wasn't physically there, and no, the demon had left when he wasn't physically there. I see. How did he do that? Well, because he had the two natures. Because as God, the word of the Father, united to the Father, he oversees everything. He's in control of everything. And physically, though he's in one place, as God, he sees everything and can command <clears throat> demons wherever they are. Because he's overseeing all creation. You want okay, me I'm following. You catch it? Well, explain. Well, look what he said. I did. He goes, go. The demon has left. How do you know that, Jesus? You're physically standing here with me. Because although physically I'm with you, as God, I'm overseeing everything. And I've already told the demon, leave and don't come back. And when she went, she found out the demon had left. You see that? You do. I do. I got a couple more for you. If you go to John 1, 45 to 49. John 1, 45 to 49. If you go there. Okay. If you go there in John 1, 45 to 49, you're going to see there that Philip calls Nathaniel. Come, we found him whom Moses and the prophets have spoken of, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Philip says, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because to the Jews, they considered Nazareth a place that wasn't respectful. And if you are a respectful Jew, you wouldn't live there, right? Okay. Because you see, goes, can anything good come out of Nazareth? How can Jesus yeah. be the prophet or the Messiah the prophets wrote about when he comes from Nazareth? Nazareth is a low place. The Messiah wouldn't come out of such a low place. You get what I'm saying? I do. So that shows you he's very zealous, right? He's like zealous yes. for like, man, no Jew would come from that place. So then Jesus sees him for the first time, says, here's an Israelite in whom there's no falsehood. Meaning, look at this Israelite. Look how zealous he is for his people, Israel. Now, Nathaniel's shocked because this is the first time he's meeting Jesus. He says, and do you know me? And Jesus says, before Philip called you under the fig tree, I saw you. And then Nathaniel freaks out. Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. He freaked out. How did you see me before Philip called me? And how did you know where I was? You were not there physically. You with me there? Yes, yes. Sorry, I didn't realize you were waiting for me. Yes, no, I, no, I just I, want to I, see if it's okay. Did you catch it? He goes, did, do you I know did. me? He goes, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. And he freaked out. He goes, Rabbi, you are the Christ. You are the son of, son of God, the king of Israel. What? Wait. Why did he react that way? Because he knew, he knew there is no possible way he could have seen me physically because I was at a great distance, making it impossible for him to see me physically. How in the world did he know my location? Before Philip called me. You see that? Yeah, I do. Now let me give you a final example. If you go to John 4, read 43 all the way to 54. John 4, 43 to 54. Right? For the rest of you in the comment section, no side talks and debates about annihilationism. Learn with me as we help this young man for the glory of Christ. Learn your faith. John 4, 43 to 54. If you go there, a man comes and tells Jesus to heal who? Reader, you'll see. He comes to him and he asks him, heal my 
child, right? Yes. And then Jesus says, go, because your child is healed. When does he reach his child? When does he reach get home to see that his child was healed and then realize that Jesus, that the child was healed at the very hour Jesus said, right? He was your healed. Your son is healed. The next day, right? Yeah. So now notice the miracle. Jesus says, go, your son is healed. He doesn't get get to his house till the next day. That's how far away he is. It takes him about a day to get home. And then when he asked the servants, when was my child healed? They told him the hour. And he remembered that was the same hour yesterday that Jesus said, your son is healed. But look how far the distance. It took him a day to get to his son. How could Jesus that far away physically command his son to be healed without physically being there? I see your point. Do you know why? Because even though physically he's in one place as God, he sees everything. He's controlling everything, giving life to everything. So everything is present before him. Yes. So in heaven, there he is in heaven's throne, in that physical body of flesh and bone that's deathless. But as God, he sees all creation. He gives life to all creation. He sees you and he hears you and he's with you as God, as the word united to the Father and the Spirit. Yes. You see it? I do. But that only makes sense if Jesus is the God-man, one person who is God and has a human nature. Yes. So now, to, so John 20, 17, does it make sense why Jesus could say, my father, your father, my God, your God? Why? Because it does. Because Jesus is the Son of God, the Father is truly His Father, and because of His salvation, He now becomes our Father. But because also He became man, the Father becomes His God, just like He's our God, because we're human creatures created by the one true God. And because Jesus is also our Creator, guess what Thomas calls Him in that same chapter in John 20, 28? My Lord and my God. So the Father is the God of the disciples, and Jesus is their God. Why? Because Jesus is the word of the Father, united to the Father and the Spirit, and Jesus with the Father and the Spirit creates all creation. So he created all the disciples. So they realize Jesus, like the Father, is our God too. That's in John 20, 28. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. I see it. But the Jews don't have two gods, my brother. They only have one God, the God of Israel, yod Hey vav Hey Yahovah. So the Father is their God, and Jesus is their God, but they don't have two gods. That means the Father and the Son are the one God, but the Son is not the Father. Do you see why we're Trinitarians? I do. I do. I see. And then yesterday when you showed me that the Spirit is the God of Israel, that also that also supports what you're saying, I think. Oh, yeah, no, I'll give you more support about the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. Go to Matthew 28, 19. Richard and Snow, focus and pay attention, guys, please. Okay. Matthew 20, 19 says, go baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, let me ask you a question. Can any Muslim or Jew... Who believes in Tawheed say in the name of Allah and Muhammad and Jibreel Gabriel No In the name of Allah and Rasulullah Messenger of Allah and Ruhul Al Qudus If Ruhul Al Qudus is Gabriel I'd never heard it I don't think so That'd be sure How can you say Allah's yeah, name sure. is the name of Muhammad is the name of Gabriel Can you say that Yeah I, I no, you, no you can't But why did Jesus say the name of the Father is the name of the Son is the name of the Holy Spirit. Name one, not names, name of the Father name, and of yes. the Son of the Holy Spirit. How can the Spirit possess the same name of the Father and the Son if he's not God and he's a creature? And how can the Son possess that name? Yes, I see. Right? Yes. Now go to 2 Corinthians. Risale Buddhist. Second Corinthians. Corinthians, yeah, Corinthians, yes, Second Corinthians, chapter three, Second Corinthians, chapter three, verses seventeen to eighteen. 
Now, in Islam, there's only one Rabb, right? Rabb is Allah, right? Rabb, Lord is Allah, right? Yes. Okay, now read yes. for me 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18. Who is the Rabb there? Who is Rabb? Who is the Lord there? So who is the Lord? It says Ruh. The Spirit is the Lord? Yes. But then finish it. Then it says, Rabb, al, uh, Rabb is the Ruh. But then it says, what? Ruh al Rabb, right? I'm confused. Yes. The Lord is the Spirit, but the Spirit belongs to the Lord. Rabb al Ruh, Ruh al Rabb. So there's two. The Spirit, He is the Lord, and He belongs to the Lord. Yes. So how many persons are called Rabb? Two. The Spirit who is Rabb, the Lord, and the Spirit who belongs to the Rabb, who is the Lord. And you know, in that context, yes. you know who that Lord is that the Spirit belongs to? Um, I, I, I didn't read it. Messiah. If you read from 12 to 18, it's Messiah, the Messiah. So Messiah is Rabb, and the Spirit is Rabb, and the Spirit belongs to the Rabb, who is Messiah, Messiah. Yes. So wait. Jesus and the Spirit are Rob, the Lord? I see. I see. I, I see it. I see the Messiah. Right? Yes. So Messiah, the Messiah is the Lord, Rob. The Spirit is Lord, Rob. And the Spirit belongs to the Lord, Rob, meaning Rob al Messiah. Ruch al Rob al Messiah and Ruch is Rob. Both of them are Lord. Yeah. Well, how is that possible? How can you have the Spirit being the Lord and Messiah being the Lord and the Spirit belonging to the Lord Messiah and the Spirit having the same name of the Father and the Son if the Son and the Spirit are not one with the Father in His that, His essence, nature as God? So then, so then, Yahweh is that is that is that yes. Yahweh? I, okay, I think Yahweh. so. Yahweh. Yahweh okay. is their so name. Then that is the the three. Yes, the Aknum is Aknum is Yahwa. Ah, Alhamdulillah. Yes, Yahwa is the Father. Yahwa is the Son. Yahwa is the Spirit. Ruh. That's why we say Bism al Ab, wal Ibn, wal Ruh Qudus Ilahin Wahid. Right? Yes, Ilah al Wahid. Yes. Yes. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, because the Father is Yahwa, Jehovah. The Son is Yahweh, Jehovah. The Spirit is Yahweh, Jehovah. But Jehovah is one, but the Father and Son and Spirit are not one. <clears throat> They're Akanim, Akanim. Three. Yes. Yeah. Right? Three persons. Okay, yes. Clear, huh? It is, it is clear. More questions? Ask me, I'm here. It was the one about the gods. The one where oh, yeah, okay. Jesus said, doesn't it say in Shariat Musa is is whoever believes in yes, God, one. your old gods are yeah, I'll yeah. answer that one. Another good question. Now, real quickly, there's someone J Bach Varghese. Did you get my article today? I posted my article refuting the oneness heretics and their misuse of Acts 238. Did you get that article? Or do you want me to send you the link? I already addressed that. The oneness heretics that misuse Acts 238 to show. Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If not, I'll get it for you later. Now, for the rest of you, focus and learn. Pray with me for our brothers. I help him. I'll get it to you, Varghese. Just wait. Now, go to John 10. This is what you're asking me for. John 10. Okay. In John 10, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, Is it not written in your law? I say you are God's. Right? John 10, 34, 35. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's a shariatukum, not shariat musa. I yeah, was recalling yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah the there's sharia no, there is, no is the zabur. He's quoting the zabur. He's calling, quoting the song. Okay. But if you read it, it says, Is it not written in your law? I say you are gods. Okay. Then in 35, what does he say in 35? If they are called gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. What he means there is, if it's kitab, if it's the kitab of God, then you cannot accuse the book of lying. You cannot accuse the book of saying something false and lying about God because this is the word of God. It's kitab Allah. 
So if in the kitab of God, the law of God, others can be called gods, and you'll never say that book is wrong, that is a lie from the devil, because you'll be sinning, right? If there's something, for example, if, if the Quran says something and I say it's wrong, then I'm sinning. I'm stuck for Allah. How can you say the Quran is wrong, right? Yeah, right. That's right. what Jesus is saying to the Jews. Your psalm calls these people gods. Is your psalm, the Zabur, wrong? It's stuck for Allah. You can't say that. Because if you say it's wrong, you're saying that God is wrong because God, that's God's word. So you have to accept the fact that even the word of God, the Sharia of God, calls people gods, right? That's what it's quoting. In, in what context? So I'll get what to does the, that yeah, mean? I'll show you the context, but I want you to understand the logic of Jesus. Jesus is saying, can you say this book, which is the law of God, the Sharia of God, the word of God, Zabur, is wrong, sinning, committing shirk? Of course not. They can't say that, right? Yes, they can't. Because if they do, then they're saying, one of the books of Allah, the Qutub, is wrong. That means Allah made a mistake because the Jews believe that is the book of Allah. And there are no mistakes in the book of Allah. So Jesus is catching them. It's like me when I quote your Quran, I say, hey, your Quran says this. Is the Quran wrong? You'll say, no, it's not. It's not wrong. Thank you. That's what Jesus is saying. Is the book wrong? You know it's not wrong. So that's first point I want you to get. What is he trying to do? He's trying to show them that even in the law, the Sharia, the Zabur, others are called gods. And that's not a mistake in the book because God's book has no mistakes because it's written by Wahi, right? Inspiration. Yes. Okay, so that's the first point. Did you get the first point? Yes, so, but my question is about the word Sharia. Ah. I yeah. thought the word Sharia ah was always about Musa. No. That's what I thought. That's what I thought the Sharia ah was. No, it's not. Sharia so means what is Sharia, ah? Sharia means the legislation, the commands that God has given in all the books. It's not just the books of Moses that give you commands. Even in the Zabur, God gives you commands. Even in the Kitab of Isaiah or Jeremiah, all of the books of God contain Sharia, contain rules, contain laws, contain regulations. Okay. Okay. It's now now I'm Musa. following one hundred percent. Say it again. Now I'm following 100%. So you got the I'm point, though. Him. He's saying in your own I, law, I did, yes. so you can't say the law is wrong because then you'd be sinning against God, right? I see, yes. Okay, I see now, that. why he quotes this? Now let's go and see why he quotes it. Go to the psalm. He's quoting the psalm. Zabur, go to Psalm 82. One second. I think it's called Mazmur. Yeah, Mazmur. I think it's the, the Quran okay. calls the psalms Zabur or Zubur. Zubur. Yes. But it's Mazmur, Mizmor in Hebrew, Mizmor. Okay. Shar Hashari. Okay. What right. verse? Psalm 82. Or what if you go to Psalm 82, watch what happens here. Okay. Mizmor in Hebrew, Mazmur. And then uh, in Quran, it's Zabur. Now in Psalm 82, in verse 1, it says, God takes his stand in the congregation. Of God to judge the gods. That's verse one, right? Yes, Allah fi majlisi al-ilahi fi wasat al-aliha yaqdi. Okay. Now, does it in English have an uppercase G and a lowercase G? Yeah, or in, in English, it? yeah, it's uppercase. But that forget, let it all be uppercase, all uppercase, uppercase G. Okay. God in the congregation of God with the gods. Uppercase, lowercase means nothing. But I want you to know okay. who the gods are, because notice God is going to judge them. God is going to judge okay. these gods. Why? Because I want you to just read for yourself verses 2 to 5. These gods are the evil rulers of the world. They are corrupting the world. They're spreading evil. They're not helping the poor, the Mesakin. Uh, they are helping evildoers to succeed. And God is fed up with them because they are evil rulers destroying the earth. So now he's going to judge them and destroy them. Do you see it? I do. Okay. But now verse 6 where Jesus is quoting from. I say you are gods and all of you are the sons of the Most High, right? Yes. But then in verse 7 it says, but you shall die like a man, like Adam, and fall like, yeah, like any Bashar. ruler. Right? Yes. You catch it here? I, I Yes, I did, I did. 
So here you have a psalm where rulers who are evil and wicked and corrupt, and they're still called gods and the sons of God, and God is so disgusted with them that he's going to judge them and destroy them because they're evil, they're wicked, and they're corrupt. You with me there? I don't... I, I do. I don't know how it is in the Torah, but I know in the Quran, Pharaoh says, Ana rabbukum al -ala, yes. which means like, which he does say. Yes. And is that, that how it also goes? No, not in, not in our Torah, Torah, but there are places where rulers say they are gods. Okay, now, there are places, okay. but not, not, not with Pharaoh. But now here, okay. what I want you to see is these rulers are evil. They're wicked, they're corrupt, and God is going to punish them and destroy them. I just want you to keep that in mind. Okay. So why are I, they I called am, gods yes. and why are they called the sons of the Most High? Well, because here, this is how the Bible works. If you are appointed to rule by God, God gives you, he gives you shultan, he gives you authority, right? Yeah. He expects you to represent him. He expects you to rule in a way pleasing to him, representing him on earth. So in that sense, you are called God. Why? Because you are standing in the place of God, representing God, ruling the way God wants you to rule on earth. Right? Yes. That's how the Bible works. This is the language of the Bible. I can call someone okay. God if he is appointed by God to stand for God, represent God, and rule for God the way God wants him to rule. But once I stop ruling the way God wants me to rule, and I corrupt myself and I be evil, that's when God comes and judges me and removes me and destroys me. You in okay. there? You understand? I am. So what is Jesus saying? Here's Jesus' point. He's saying to the Jews, if these rulers who are evil and corrupt and wicked, whom God is going to destroy and kill because they're evil and corrupt, and they still can be called gods, how dare you get angry with me when I say I'm the son of God, one with him, who can do everything that the father does, and the miracles I do prove it, when I am truly God's son, and I am truly one with him, and I am pure and righteous, and have the power and ability to do what only God can do. If these evil rulers can be called gods, even though they're not, how dare you accuse me of sinning, when I'm telling you I am the true Son of God, one with the Father, who can do whatever the Father does, and the miracles I do prove who I am. How dare you make that accusation against me? That makes sense. Because that's what he's saying. Go read it. Here, now go back. Okay. Go back now. John 10. At, uh, John 10. Okay, and what verse was that? We're going to start at 30 and read all the way to 33. Start okay. there first. That, that's when the accusation comes. So he says, I am the Father one. And it says, at this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, right? Yes. And then he says, many good works, many miracles I've done from my Father. Which of these do you stone me? You're going to kill me after all the good miracles I did showing you that the Father is with me? So now 33, they say... For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you are man, make yourself out to be God. Okay? How can you, a man, claim to be God? That's when he quotes their law. Is it not written in your law, I say you're God? He's like saying, hold on. These rulers, these human rulers, who are evil and corrupt and wicked, whom God killed, were they called gods? Yes. When they were called gods, was the Sharia wrong? No, it can't be wrong. Even though they're evil and wicked? Yes. And that you then dare say of me, whom the Father set apart and sent into the world. Now notice in 36. Unlike these rulers, I came from the Father out of heaven. He sent me into the world. And then you dare accuse me of sinning when I said I'm the Son of God? And then in 37, 38, he says, Believe me when I tell you I am the Son of God. I'm one with the Father. I can do all that the Father does, unlike them, because do, see the miracles I do. The miracles prove the Father's living in me and I'm living in the Father. And they get even more angry and they want to kill him even more in 39. I see. That's a reading that makes me wonder about, like, in the 
in the Quran, why did they want to why did they want to crucify him? That's the question we ask the Muslims. If Jesus was just preaching Tawheed and he was preaching the Torah of Musa, why did the Jews get so angry and hate him and want to kill him? The Quran has no answer. The Bible has an answer because the Jews were getting upset and they were losing their mind that a Jew, a human being, flesh and blood Jew and son like them is claiming to be God Almighty, the Son of the Father. In yeah. fact, can I And then there's you? another another sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. What is it? Oh, I was I was gonna say just like there's another place where like the Quran quotes the the Jews and then they say uh, that, that the Jews said that we killed the Messiah, yes. but then wouldn't the Jews not even believe that he's the Messiah? That's the other were... mistake. How, how which Jew is gonna go around boasting, hey, we killed the Messiah? It's like saying, Hey, we killed our Prophet Muhammad. We insulted our Prophet Muhammad, Rasulullah. Would a Muslim say that? No. So why would a Jew said go they killed the one that 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 that, yeah. that like we killed the one that said or claimed yes, to right. be the Messiah? We killed the one that you think is the Messiah, or we killed him because he's a false Messiah. But they're not going to say, "Hey, we killed the Messiah, and we're happy about it. We're proud." Right? Yeah. And just to yes. prove to you, that's why they had Jesus killed. Why do they want Jesus to be killed? Go to John eighteen thirty one. John eighteen thirty one. Okay, oh. but before you say anything, who's this Anthony A guy? Is he a Muslim? Anthony A, I see you've been running your mouth and you want to see Sam destroyed. Neither Allah nor His Messenger can destroy me because I'm protected by Jesus, the Almighty Son of God, and covered by His blood, filled by His Spirit. Anyway, if Anthony is a Muslim, when I'm done with him, let Anthony call me so he can school me. Anthony, you're next, buddy. John 18, 31. What does it say, brother? What did the Jews tell Pilate? We have a law, and according That's to our law, Pilatus? he must be done. Is that the same person we're talking about? In John 18, 31, the Jews are saying to Pilate, we have a law. Okay. John 18, 31. If you read it there, yeah. it says, if you first read it, they say, what do they say? They go to Pilate. Oh, we can't kill him? We can't kill him. And why do they want him to die? John 19, 7. So we can't kill him. We're coming to you to kill him. So why are they coming to Pilate to kill him? Because John 19, 7. So notice, we're coming to you because according to our law, he needs to die, but we can't kill him because it's against the law. So Pilate, you kill him for us. Why do you want him dead, Jews? John 19, 7. What does it say there in John 19, Because 7. he claimed to be the son of God. What would make the Jews want them to have Jesus killed by the Romans for claiming to be the son of God? If he was just claiming to be a son of God like you and me, like the Jews are, why then try to kill him? So wait, I'm, I'm confused. First they say that we have we have our Sharia and our Sharia says that we can't kill him. And then here's here here they say we have a Sharia and that Sharia yeah. taqdi alayhi bil mawt, which means it, yes. it, it will, you know, it means he deserves to die because he claims to be the son of God. And so yet we can't, we can't kill him according to our Sharia, because then the Romans are going to kill us and throw us in jail. So we're asking you to kill him for us. I'll give you an example. I'm still confused. Okay, well, think about it. Islamic Sharia, you catch a woman in Zinna, she's supposed to be stoned, right? Well, and but if you have to verify what okay, you verified it. No, you did. You verified okay. it. Let's skip that. Okay. She has to be okay. killed, right? Okay. But you live but in the, the UK. Ruler, the Hakim has to do But it. you live in the UK. How are you going to kill her? Oh, you can't. I see. That's what the Jews are saying. Okay, okay. We can't kill him because you rule over us. We're under your Sharia. And if we try to kill him, then you're going to throw us in jail and kill us. It's like in the UK, if the Hakim says, you've caught this woman, Zina, kill her, what will the UK do to them? Uh, then they, they, they won't do anything if they try to kill her anyway. What will oh, they then do? they're gonna be tried? Then these people are gonna be tried for okay. probably attempted. And murder. in America, if if a Muslim is caught committing zinna and there are four witnesses and they go to kill her, what is the American government gonna do? Say, Oh, it's okay, your sharia says kill her, it's all right. No, I see, I see, okay. I see. So, what are the Jews telling? So, in the rest, of oh, sorry, go ahead, no, go ahead, say, make your point. 
No, in the verse before that, that you that you pointed to before, it was it in eighteen or John eighteen thirty one says that okay, 18, it's 30. against your law, the law, your law, the law that we're under, you Romans, Pilate, to put anyone to death. That's why we're coming to you. If you read it, you need to kill him, oh, put him to death. Okay. Right? I confused when, when I read the word Sharia. I, I, I thought that it was talking about the, the, their Sharia, not no, the no. Sharia of the, the place that they're being ruled by. No, who are they talking to? Read the verses before. They're gone to Pilate. He is yeah, the one ruling to, yes, yes. Judea for the emperor. The emperor sent Pilate to yes, rule Hudu Judea. Yes. Okay. And then they're saying in John 19, 7, our Sharia says he has to be put to death. He claimed to be a son of God. So we're coming to you because only you can put him to death. Put him to death for us. And so what he's saying is, I don't care he claimed to be the son of God. That's not grounds to put him to death in my law. Give me something. Show me something. That he did so that by Roman law, I can put him to death. They go, well, he claimed to be the king because Messiah, Messiah means king. So by claiming to be a king, he's going to lead the Jews against Rome and he's going to cause a revolution. And that's grounds to put him to death. So another question about that. So I thought the word Messiah meant memsuh bizzayt. I don't know what that means in English, but like, like anointed with oil or something. I don't know. I, I'm trying translating very literally. Yeah, it can mean anoint with oil, but anoint also means anointed by God. Okay. Not necessarily just oil, because it says the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And when he comes upon you, he's anointing you. So it's either anointed with oil or anointed with power, meaning God pours out okay. his spirit and power on you. Okay. You see? So it's not simply anointed with oil. Anointed in the Bible means God has now anointed you for something. He's given you his power. He's given you his spirit to do something, whether to prophesy, whether to rule, or whether to do what Messiah is supposed to do. And you see Jesus the Messiah is anointed to do the Father's will in saving us from our sins, paying the debt of our sins, and then he'll return to establish his kingdom on earth. Okay. Okay, but not to confuse you. Why did the Jews want him killed? Because he claimed to be God in the flesh. The but what in what way, son of God? Because all the Jews thought they were the sons of God. I I, I think I, I don't I don't know where where is that said. Oh yeah, Exodus four twenty two. God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh. Oh, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may worship me in the wilderness. Exodus 4, 22 and 23, right? I see. And okay. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, it says, You are all the sons and daughters of God, meaning Israel. Bani Israel, you are all sons of God. Okay, so okay. the Jews were sons of God, meaning God chose them. God made them a nation. God blessed them, gave them land, gave them Sharia, and, and would provide for them. But if they sinned, he punished them. So my question is, why would they want Jesus to be killed for claiming to be the son of God if he was simply claiming to be the son of God like they were? They were all sons of God. But then didn't he all also say, I and the Father are one? That's why. So wouldn't that be? That's the okay. point. My point is, he wasn't claiming to be a son of God like them. That's my point. If you just said, I'm a son of God, I'll say, well, we're all sons of God. God is our Father in heaven. He's our Heavenly Father. We are spiritual children. He created us. He made us to be his people, to honor him, and to live according to Sharia. But Jesus was saying something more, more than they could say, which got them angry because they're, real, they're realizing, wait, you're not claiming to be a son of God like I am. You're claiming to be the son of God that makes you equal to the Father, that shows that you can do whatever the father does, the way he does it, impossible because you're a man and no creature can do what the father does unless you're God Almighty. But how can you be God Almighty when you're not the father and you're a man? And that's why they're losing it. They're going crazy and angry. What are you saying? Okay, I see. Because you're going to have to explain. Why have him killed for claiming the son of God? Why didn't they get David killed? David was the son of God. Solomon was the son of God. Israel's called the son of God. How come they didn't get killed for that? Because he wasn't claiming to be the son of God like them. 
He was saying, you are some, like here, the disciples, my father, your father. See, if he's my father, he's your father. That means you're the sons of God, but you're not sons of God like I am. You see, my father, your yes. father, my God, your God. Though you are his sons, you're not sons like I am. I'm the son of God that's unique and different than all of you. Because I'm the son of God who can do whatever the father does the same way he does it. I'm the son of God who was with the father before creation, before the world, in the same glory, which is something you cannot say of any other son of God. Yeah. You see why they're flipping? They're going crazy. They're getting angry. I do. I do. Okay. So any other confusion? Okay, if I'll not, see. if you have more questions, ask me, brother. Okay, um, I have, I have, I have one more observation sure. about the Gospel of John. Before it's not, it's not a question. It's more of an observation. Sure. Um, it was around the time when Jesus had fed everybody, and then he was saying to some people, "You followed me because you you are full now because because I fed Not you." Six. And I, I drew a parallel from that to the muallafat You know who those are. In, in Islam, those are the ones that are like weak in faith, and then they get a certain percentage yeah. of the yeah. money so that, the so that they can 60, continue yeah. to believe. Yeah, chapter 9, verse 6, uh, chapter 9, verse 60, Surah Tawbah. But no, it's a little different because there the Quran says you give part of your zakat to then ha incline their hearts to Islam, almost like bribery. Jesus didn't do the miracle. Yes. Jesus didn't yes, do the miracle exact, to bribery. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, make your point. Oh, I'm Oh, I was going to say that, that 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 he didn't want them to follow him because exactly. because of the food. Yes. And then and then and then the, the muallafat the qulubuhum, it's the exact opposite. You exactly. follow us, we'll make you we'll make you we'll give you money, but Beautiful. please believe. Yes. That's excellent observation. Whereas in Islam it says Surah at tawbah ayah 60, you use money to bribe people to become Muslim. Jesus says, that's not the kind of followers I want. Exactly. You're 100% on the mimi. See, the Holy Spirit is giving you okay. wisdom. I don't want kind of people who just want to follow me for miracles and benefit because that means your heart is not for me. It's you're coming to me to see what you can get from me. You're not coming to me for me. You're not loving me for me. You're only loving me for what I can give you. So if I stop giving you something, you're going to turn against me and hate me. Yes, I found that very, very, it's, Amazing, a, it's right? a very different approach. It really shows you who cared about the numbers and who cared about, like, the, the like, you know, it, it was a different, it was a very different thing. If you cared about the numbers, then you don't care if you're bribing people to follow you. You want an army, you want, you want a big, you know, number of followers. But, I, you know, I was very, I didn't know about, about, about that before. Yeah, see, Jesus so doesn't want people to come for the benefit he will bless you he loves you he will give you he yes. wants you to come for him because you love him for who he is and when you come to him for him and want him and love him then he will bless you but everything else that's what jesus says first seek god and his kingdom the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you but your priority is i want to seek the rule of god in my life i want to see god's standard for my life live according to god's teachings live according to God's rule, to honor God for the sake of God, because I love God for who God is. And God says, if that's your motive, I will bless you with what you need. But if your first motive is, I want to come to God so he can make my life easier and get me a wife and beautiful children and a big fat bank account, then you're not coming for me. You're only coming for the benefit. And these are the kind of people I don't want. Because when I stop blessing you, and when fitna comes, fitin comes, trials come, you will turn your back on me and abandon me the moment you suffer trials for me. Right? Yeah. Yes. So it's like a marriage. Does my wife love me for me or because I'm rich and I got a Mercedes and a Porsche and a mansion? But then when I go bankrupt, the stock market crashes and they take away my home and my cars and I'm penniless and she abandons me and takes off. That means she never loved me. She loved what I could benefit her and give her. And that shows you that she wasn't loyal. She was a thief and a crook and a liar and a deceiver. And that's the kind of people God doesn't want. And another thing, okay. difference between Jesus and Muhammad, the difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Muhammad says, anyone who abandons his deen, kill him. Jesus 
his disciples left him and he didn't chase after them. He didn't threaten to kill them. He looked at the 12, the Hawaii, and he said, do you want to leave also? Here, go to John 6. Go to John 6. The same gospel, John, John 6. Okay. Okay. Read for me. Okay. We go to John 6. Read for me 65 and 66. See what it says there. He says, no one comes to me except, except yeah, unless the Father enables you, unless the Father enables you to accept me, you won't be able to. And then 66, it says, they all walked away never to follow him again, right? Yes. Did Jesus say, go after them, kill them, behead them, give them three days? He looks to the Hawaii and look what he says. And then in 60, 67, 69, look what he says. Yep, 666, the number of Muhammad. Yes. Is God. Now, 67, <laughs> yeah, 67 to 69. I see it, yeah. You, what, you see what he says? He goes, you want to leave me too? You don't want to leave me also, do you? Notice what Peter said. He goes, Lord, to whom shall we turn? Uh, we know that you have the words of eternal life, and we believe that you're the Holy One of God. Where else can we go? We don't understand everything we, you say. You do things that confuse us and shock us. And, and cause us to be scared because you do things that no man can do. You do things that only God can do, but you're a man, so we haven't figured out. But one thing we know, you have the words of life. You have the words of never-ending life. Who else can we go to? So notice the difference between a Muhammad and a Jesus. Muhammad says anyone who abandons his deen, kill them. Jesus lets you go and doesn't send Christians to behead you, to slit your throat. To rape your women, even if they're married, or to do muta with your women. Very, it's a, it's a big difference. But so, so Saman Butros is Peter, right? Yep, Simon Butros Peter is Peter. Okay. No, when 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 um, when he slices the ear of that guy, and then a little bit after that, they ask him if he was if he if he knew Jesus, and then he didn't he deny that. Yes, didn't he three also times he denied Jesus, point? yes, because he thought okay. that Jesus being the Messiah would be like Muhammad leading jihadis, fi sabil Allah, fi sabil al-ab. He thought that Jesus was going to be like a military political figure like Muhammad, command Jewish armies yes. to go and attack and subjugate Romans and unbelievers to the rule of Isa. And Jesus said, no, that's not the kind of Messiah I am. I'm not here to slay my enemies. And to establish a kingdom by force, by the sword. I'm here to die for my enemies, to save them from their sin, so that when I come from heaven, they can live with me forever on earth. And if not, then I will judge them and throw them in Jahannam, in hell. So, but Peter's okay. thinking like Muhammad, Peter's thinking like Abu Bakr, Peter's thinking like Uthman ibn Affan well, like Khalid, yeah. yeah, or Khalid ibn Walid. He's thinking, Messiah's here, oh, now yeah. we can kill. And be killed for Allah and his messenger. The mindset of Muhammad, right? Yeah, and Umar. Yeah, Umar ibn al-Khattab. So what did Jesus say? No, Peter. Yeah. So Peter is now shocked. He's confused. Now let me explain why he's shocked and confused. He's the Messiah. The Messiah is the king of creation. All nations must bow to him and, and worship him. But he's telling me, no, you don't fight my enemies, Israel's enemies. You don't kill them. You don't defend me. I surrender my life to them. They're going to kill me. And he's confused. How? This doesn't make sense. You're the Messiah. The Messiah is the king. The king conquers his enemies. He doesn't die for his enemies. So he's confused. He's shocked. He doesn't know what's going on. And so when he sees Jesus in the trial, he knows, uh-oh, he's not the kind of Messiah who's going to kill his enemies. So if they find out I'm one of him, I'm with him, they're going to arrest me too and throw me in jail and kill me. I don't know him. I have nothing to do with him. That's why he's afraid. I see. Okay, okay, I see. So out of the the, 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 the disciples, there was more than one Yehuda, right? Or yes, Judas? there are several. Yeah. The, the word Yehuda is okay. a common name. There's several. It's not one. The one who betrayed him is yeah. Yehuda Skariuta. Skariut. Yes, Skariut. Yeah. Ish uh, Kariuth. He's the one who betrayed him, and then he committed suicide. But now, again, you want to see the difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Peter denied him three times, right? 
Yes. Okay, now go to John 21. Let me show you again the difference between how Jesus treats his enemies, those who deny him, and how Muhammad did. If you deny Muhammad and you discard your deen, you are to be killed. Now, I know the Quran also allows taqiyya to conceal. Yeah. There's a verse in the Quran, chapter 16, verse 106. But that's a different story. I want you to watch how Jesus restores Peter. This is now three weeks after the resurrection. Yes, sir. Three weeks later. So wait, chapter 21, verse 21, what? Verses 15 and 17. But before you read, let me give you the context before you read. Okay. This is now three weeks later. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Three weeks later. Peter and the other disciples go fishing. Early in the morning, they see Jesus on the shore. He calls them. They have fish, 153 pieces of fish. He's cooking fish and he's feeding them. As he feeds them, he asks Peter three times. Pay attention. In John 21, verses 15 and 17, he says, Simon Barjona, Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? Meaning, do you love me more than the fish, more than your job? And he said, yes, Lord, Rob, you know I love you. Right? You know I love you. And what did Jesus say? Yes. Feed my lambs, right? Yeah, I cannot feed. Feed my sheep. Yeah, to, to, to. Again, he asked him yeah. second time. Simon, son of Peter, son of John. I'm sorry. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Feed my lambs. Now, the third time. Watch here. This is where you see Jesus is God. He's a rub. Notice rub, but notice this. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. He was hurt. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Did you catch it? Two things. Jesus is Lord I, and he knows everything. He's al, yes. what they call al alim. He's the knowing, right? Yes. How can Jesus be all knowing if he's not God? Yes. And, the kulashe, yes. and how can Peter call him? Rab, when the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses 79 and 80, Allah will not allow you to serve a prophet or take a prophet or an angel as your Lord. Rab. Well, doesn't Rab also have a, like a different way, like, like Adonai and Adoni, where there's yeah. Rab, like Rab al-Usra, which many, is like the Adoni of the does family, Does the Quran make that distinction? Does it say Allah will never allow you know. to take a prophet as Rab, Surah Al-Imran? And, and which verse was that? Go to Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses 79 to 80. It says, a prophet will not enjoin you to serve him, to do ibadah to him, nor would Allah allow you to take a prophet or angel as a rab. Right there, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses yes. 79 to 80, right? Yes. So wait, does Allah make a distinction between Adonai and Adonai? No, no. Okay, so if Jesus is just a Rasul, a messenger, or a prophet, Nabi, why is he allowing Peter to call him Rab? But then secondly, how many Rabs know everything? He says, you know yeah. everything. You know all things. How many Rabs are all-knowing? So it has to be Al-Rab. You got Rab. it. Rab. Because Peter said, why? Peter's saying, you don't need to ask me if, you love, if I love you. Why? Because you know my heart. You know if I love you without me telling you because you know all things. If you know all things, you already know the answer, right? If God knows everything, does he have to ask me whether I love him? He already knows, right, because he knows everything? Yeah, he already knows. But that's why Peter's saying, why are you asking me? You know all things. You know if, that I love you. Rob, who knows all things, you know my heart. You know whether I love you or not. I can't hide it from you because you know my heart. You know all things. Nothing can be hidden from you, Rob. So this can means that Jesus has to be a Rabb, the Lord, Rabbul Alameen yes. in the flesh. But then here's the question for you. Why did Jesus ask him three times, do you love me? Gently, humbly, he asked him. He didn't yell at him, you know, do you love me? Shame on. Why three times, brother? Because of the number of times he betrayed him? Yes. You see the heart of Jesus? Jesus do. doesn't embarrass you. He doesn't humiliate you when you sin. He comes gently to restore you. He says to you, my son, do you repent? You are forgiven. So notice the heart of Jesus for Peter. He doesn't embarrass him. He doesn't say, Peter, shame on you. How dare you betray me? Look, I'm alive in front of your face. Don't you feel embarrassed, you wicked dog? Something I would do because I'm filthy. But 
he says to him gently, lovingly, Simon, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. So he's restoring him three times. So what you learn from here, unlike Allah and his messenger, when Jesus comes to you to restore you, he doesn't come harshly. He doesn't come to embarrass you or shame you or humiliate you. He comes gently to you and he says to you, my beloved son, my child, my brother, do you repent of your sin? You are forgiven because I love you. That's what he said to Peter. Yes. Okay. I am following there. Okay. I see that. See? So, okay. So I, it's something I've been wondering about, which is also, which probably would lend into a very, very long discussion well, because ahead. I've, I've looked it up and I saw a lot of, a lot of debate or a lot of, I mean, discussion on it is since, since there is this new covenant. So how do you really know what's right from wrong in the sense of, you know, like, you know, murder is wrong, but yes, like yes. in the other ways where Sharia Musa oh, yes, doesn't yes. apply anymore how do you really yeah. make the distinction of okay this applies this doesn't apply why do you think like, you i have... know about the eating yeah. part i know the the eating part i know that that it, it was that jesus explicitly said that yeah. which yes. is not what enters the mouth it what makes yeah. it unclean it's what comes why? out so i know about that one but well, the, how, the why rest, do you think I'm brother really why sure. do you think you have 27 books of the new testament in the books of risala paul bulis and uh, shimon johanna they tell you the do's and don'ts to who? To all of them. For who? To all of it. Romans, okay. Corinthians. It's full of instructions. How to treat your wife. How to treat your husband. How to raise your kids. How to treat your masters if you happen to be a slave. Because at that time, slavery was a fact of life. So what he's telling the slaves, until you can get free, until you get free, you get your freedom. If you have a master who owns you, who's not a Christian, for the sake of the Lord, honor him. Let Jesus then reward you until you can get your freedom. The books there are given to tell you how much of the Sharia of Musa is binding on you. The law of Moses is it's, it's similar phenomenon to the Quran. Again, I'll give you an example, just because from okay. your background. The Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 48, it says, Unto you, Muhammad, we sent down the book in truth, confirming what is between your hands, and Muhaiminin alayh, meaning it is a, a guardian over it. What that means is, the Quran tells Muslims what commands of the Torah and the Injil Muslims follow and what commands they are freed from. For example, if you go to the tafsir, the commentary, it says that this, this ayat, the ayat, not this, these ayat from 43, was quote-unquote revealed when the Jews came to Muhammad saying, we've caught a man and woman in zinna, how do you judge? He says, give me your Torah, judge by your Torah. So what the Quran is telling Muhammad is, okay. you tell the Jews, you're going to judge them by the Torah. You tell the Christians, you're going to judge them by the Injil. And you tell your community, the Ummah, that they are to use the Quran to determine which parts of the legislation of Moses they follow, which parts they're free from. So stoning, we still stone people in Zinnah. Uh, when it comes to pig meat, we don't eat pig meat, but we eat camel meat, even though the Sharia of Musa said no camel meat. And There's the no Sharia, Sharia Musa yeah. said Sabbath, right? No, you, it's Juma, Friday. Yeah. Same thing with the gospel. Yeah. Same thing. And to prove it to you that even the Quran agrees that what Jesus came to do is tell you which parts of the Torah of Moses you follow, which parts you are freed from. And now you follow my interpretation, my law, through my Hawariun. The disciples whom I'll send the spirit yeah. to tell you. Even the Quran says that in chapter 3, verse 50, it's called Jesus saying, I confirm <laughs> the Torah. <laughs> yes, I confirm the Torah between my hands and to make lawful for you that which was unlawful, haram. Yeah, yeah. When the funny thing, doesn't it also say, Where Yeah, that's from chapter 61, verse 6. That's in Surah oh, Al-Saf. Yeah, that's Surah okay, Al-Saf. Okay. Yeah, but the one you're talking about, you're talk that one was chapter 61, verse 6, where he says, Ahmed. The one I'm talking about is Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 50, where it says, I confirm the Torah between my hands, making lawful for you that which was forbidden, unlawful. So that's what the New Testament says. Jesus tells us the Torah, the law, and the prophets are fulfilled in me. I complete them, I perfect them. So follow me and follow the Sharia, the law of my disciples, the Hawariyun. When I send them the spirit, 
and the Spirit will make known to them what commands to tell you to follow and what commands you're freed from. Yes. So that's where okay. your journey begins. Meaning as a baby Christian, you now grow. You read the 27 books. It's going to tell you this is what you can eat. This is what you don't eat. This is the day you celebrate. This is the day you don't celebrate. This is how you treat your wife. This is how you don't treat. This is it's there. 27 books. Okay. 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 And um, so, you know, when you mentioned the word Sabbath, I was reading the story of Ashab al sept Those yeah. that are, that are, that are the cursed. The the Sabbath and things. I was fish. reading... Uh, I was reading the tafsir and it said that, that initially, you know, God wanted everybody to be, to have their Friday, it, with it being the Friday, not being Saturday, even though in Arabic it's Sept, which is like Shabbat. Yeah. So it is, I mean, so it was, it was very weird to see how detached some of the stories exactly. are from what I'm reading you know why? in the Bible. You know why? Because Muhammad in his hatred for the Jews, when he turned against the Jews, he taught the opposite, he even said, there's hadith where it says, if the Jews do this, Christians do this, we do the opposite. But in the beginning, he would also fast Ashura. You remember that? Yes, Ashura. And yes. what was that day? That was the day celebrating when Israel came out of Egypt, right? Oh, I didn't know oh, that. Yes, that's in okay. the hadith. That was a celebration of Bani Sariyam because of what Moses did. And he says, we have more right to Moses. But then what happened? He then canceled it. He didn't make it far. He made it sunnah if you want to do it. And then he then instituted Ramadan. But then notice when he was praying, he was praying towards the Qibla of Jerusalem, the direction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem yes. Only changed when the Jews started making fun of him and rejected him. So then he turned his direction. Notice in the beginning, he's acting like the Jews, praying like the Jews, fasting like the Jews. But then when the Jews reject him and make fun of him and expose him, he turns against them and he says, okay, Saturday, we're going to do Friday. They pray for it toward Jerusalem. We're going to pray towards Mecca. They fast in Ashura. We're going to fast Ramadan just to go against them out of his hatred for them. Okay. Okay. And and also the whole uh, Uzair ibn Allah. I don't really Where? know who Uzair is and I still what didn't find source? out anywhere. Where in the history of the Jews? Give me one source. Say Muslims, quote to me one source before, during, after Muhammad. That's not from Muslim sources that say that the Jews worship someone called Uzair. Uzair is the son of Allah. Like the Christians worship Messiah yes. as son. Where? Because Muhammad is making up stuff to give Muslims a reason to attack the Jews and hate the Jews and be violent against the Jews. And the reason why I mentioned the Jews is because Muhammad came up with the crazy story that Adam was created on Friday. And he was expelled. Yeah, I, I remember that. Okay, remember that. created on Friday. So if Adam was created on Friday, the best day is Friday. So we're going to worship on Friday just to go against the Jews. Okay, what proof do you have he was created on Friday, Ya Muhammad? Ya Muhammad, where do you have proof he's created on Friday? I say so. Yeah. Why? Because I want to worship on Friday. And why Friday? Because Sunday was for the Christians. And even said, they do Saturday, the Jews. Christians do Sunday. We do Friday. We'll be ahead of them. That's his hatred. But it doesn't Saturday come before Friday? Doesn't the week start? No, Saturday. Or Sunday come before, sorry, Sunday. Yeah, but see, in his mind, Sunday. Friday is still ahead of Sunday. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Friday is still yes, ahead of see, Sunday. You get it? Friday, Saturday, I Sunday. Do, ahead of them. But okay, I mean, what kind of man is this that would say, we're going to do it on Friday because the Jews do it on Saturday, Christians do it on Sunday, so we want to be opposite of them, and Friday comes before Saturdays. What kind of man is this? What kind of hate is this if it's not demonic? It's very childish. Right? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. And who, so, who yeah. believes Adam was created on Friday? You mean back then they called it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Yeah. I, yeah. And also, you know, one other thing I was thinking of is Ramadan. They say, oh, the, the Jibril came to him and they reviewed the Quran, the, like, you know, cover to cover yes. uh, in Ramadan. Ramadan. But, but which one? Which yeah. which one where was there? Was there was the stuff that was abrogated and taken away? Exactly. Like the stoning verse. Was that there? And if it was there every Ramadan, then why did he forget some of the verses? And even worse so, than yeah, that. Things like that don't make sense. Okay. Even with that, let's go. Let's say uh, the, last, the last year of his life. Gabriel, Gabriel, Jibreel reviewed the Quran twice with him. And Muhammad said, this signified that he was going to die. Because every other year, it was once. But the last year, twice. 
And there are narrations that say, Abdullah ibn Masood heard the Quran from Muhammad after Gabriel recited it to him twice to review it with him. So, Ya Uthman, O Uthman, Abdullah ibn Masood is hearing the Quran fresh from Muhammad even after Muhammad reviews it with Jibreel, Gabriel. This is according to the Muslim sources. Abdullah ibn Masood okay. even says that I memorized over 70 chapters of the Quran directly from the mouth of the messenger long before Zayyid was even a Muslim. Because remember, you know Arabic, and I'm going to translate from them. Abdullah ibn Masood okay. was a muhajir. He was one of the help, uh, uh, my, ones who migrated. Zayyid is from, from Medina. Medina. He is an Ansari, so... He wasn't even a Muslim when Abdullah ibn Masood was a Muslim. So who is more qualified to know the Quran? Someone who was a Muslim with Muhammad in Mecca or someone who only became Muslim years later after Muhammad migrated to Medina. That was Abdullah ibn Masood's point. Ya Uthman, why are you going to prioritize this man's Quran over me or even over Ubay ibn Ka'b when we heard it directly from the Prophet and we were Muslims in Mecca when Zayed was still a little baby, if, if, if he was at all born. Why are you going to prioritize him? And then you have Bukhari saying, learn the Quran from four. And it says he started with Abdullah ibn Masood and then mentioned Ubay ibn Kaab. And then there's the Hadith in Bukhari that says Ubay ibn Kaab is the master of the reciters of the Quran. And you still burn their Qurans and their Qurans did not agree with your Quran, Uthman, perfectly, and didn't even agree with each other. Abdullah ibn Masood's Quran was different from Ubay ibn Kaab. So either Muhammad did a terrible job of teaching them what the Quran is, or they had terrible memories because they didn't remember what Muhammad said perfectly. So when they wrote down the Quran, they were contradicting each other. So where is this miraculous preservation through memorization? Yeah, I, yeah, I see. Okay. This is Does why the sense? internet, the internet is the destruction of Islam. At at no time in history have Muslims had access to this information because the internet, you can be at your home in the privacy of your room, no one watching, internet, fingertip away, thousands of websites and YouTube channels quoting the Muslim sources so they can't say we're lying. Even Yasir Qadi, did you hear what he said? Remember? Go listen to the Muhammad Hijab. Did. Okay. Did you I hear did, what he I said? Did. He goes, Ubay bin Kaab. What did he say about Ubay bin Kaab? Didn't he praise him? That he was, yeah, yeah he was credible. He is the master. And he's not just some, any regular Sahabi. He is the Sahabi that you should yeah. go to. And yet he says that he was shocked when he heard the Quran being recited differently with Muhammad's approval from the way he heard it. So you yeah. can't, the, this is God's judgment on the Muslims. For years, the Muslims were mocking us. Mocking our God, our Jesus and Bible, now it's coming to smack them in the face. Now what do you have to say? Your only argument you had was you have a perfect Quran like the Bible. Now that has been destroyed. You have nothing for Islam anymore. You've been buried and the Bible now shines even more brightly and stands above the Quran much more powerfully. See? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But you know, when you say the internet will the internet will do a lot to expose it, it's not really happening here yet because we have our I don't know if your if your Arabic viewers know them, somebody like Ahmed Sbeir or Haytham Talat or those people, they, they they come to you and then they they take you know videos of people who do some sort of like criticism and then they cut them into segments and they take them out of context and then three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand people see them and they they take it because they're credible. So, so they don't really go beyond this. But, these videos will say, oh, perfect preservation. Anything else is a myth. Brother, they, they but let me share something with you. Of, of, let, me share. let me share. You're the proof that okay. people are listening. You know why? Even though you heard these people, you're still here. Do you know why? Let me tell you how human nature is. Not everyone, because a lot of people don't care. The people who don't care and they're just happy with their dean, they'll just hear anything. But you are proof it's not working because once they mention a video, curiosity, human nature. You know what? I'm going to go and find this video he's talking about. Go to YouTube, chick, 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 and then they hear it. You see what happens? Yeah. See, why didn't it stop you? That's what I did. Thank you. Because they, they don't realize that when you mention so-and-so said such and such about the Quran, there are going to be people saying, 
wow, I want to go see that video for myself now. Oops, you opened the door for people like you to now go back and check, and now the destruction has been done. So these idiots, these fools of the devil, they think they're saving their people, but they're making young people curious to know, hey, I want to go see that video, see why that guy said what he said, because my scholar is saying he's lying. And then you read it, say, wow, he didn't show me this. He didn't tell me that. He didn't show me this clip. Man, what a filthy liar my scholar turned out to be. Oops. Yeah, that's 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 you know that's what happened with me. But for someone like you know my the older relatives in my family, they will watch this and they will say, "Look, Subhanallah, see because all they, these kufar, all the lies," and yes. they stop. Right yes, there. because they don't care. They're satisfied with their life. That's my point. In other words, there are people they don't care about religion. They're satisfied with being Hindu or Muslim, and anything that reinforces their bias, they're okay with it. That's just human nature. Everyone, there are people in all walks of life. They don't really care about religion, but they are what they are because they're born into it and they're satisfied being identified. Because I guarantee many of your family members, they're Muslim by name. Are they Muslim by heart? Not very many. Okay, see, they don't care about religion, but they just don't want to change their religious identity because religion doesn't matter. I'm born Muslim. I'm going to stay Muslim. Even though Islam doesn't matter, that's just my identity. See, people don't, but then there are people who do care. They want, hey, you know what? No, I do care. It's not enough I'm born Arab and a Muslim or in India and I'm Hindu or in Iran and I'm Shia or in America I'm Christian. No, you know, that doesn't mean because I'm born in a religion, my religion is right. And if there is a God and that is not the end of humanity and I'm going to have to stand before him, I want to know who this God is to make sure when I die, I will enter his presence and not suffer his wrath. See, there are those people, and you're one of them. Yes, yes, and and I and I'm I am so happy to be one of them because it it just was it wasn't enough because you know I I, I do follow some people in English, so I was you know there was a massive conflict between the narrative I was getting from watching people who are criticizing in English and the narrative with, of the people who are responding in Arabic to the ones that were you know criti crit critics that are Arabs, but the videos of the critics they they range from three hundred thousand views to a couple of million views and that's that's a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, because you got to look at the ratio of Muslims. Look, for example, you get some stupid Muslim video that is so stupid, laughable, but because it's Muslim and you have 1.7 billion Muslims who are stuck at home, that video, you have 500,000 viewers. It's not because yeah. these guys, they are saying something earth shattering. It just, it so happens you have a higher ratio of Muslims who are watching Muslim videos from any Muslim, no matter how stupid, how bad. I've gone to videos by Muslims that made some of the stupidest arguments, and I read the Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Azwajal, Om al yes. Oh, Allah, right? Yes. And I'm looking yes. at these guys, yes. are you serious? You're impressed by this argument? Even my 10-year-old daughter will laugh at him saying how stupid he is, and Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, MashaAllah, brother, Jazakallah khairan, may Allah reward you, brother. I mean, come on, dude. Because yeah, and then they filter the comments. Yeah. They filter the comments, so there's no one that says your argument is stupid. All the comments that you have is Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Yeah, that's it. And and that's that's where it ends. That's it. So those people, unless the Holy Spirit touches them, they just want to be sheep, and it's called confirmation bias. They just want to hear something to confirm their bias. They're not interested in knowing the truth. They just want to hear something to say my religion is true. Unfortunately, that's true of all religions. There are Christians that I know that come to my channel. They want what's called confirmation bias. And a lot of them, let's say they're born Roman Catholic, born Protestant, born Orthodox. And they'll never hear anything that criticizes the Christianity they're born in. And once they hear criticism, they get angry, they get defensive, right? Not everyone's like that because I know also people on my channel that let's say were Protestant, became Orthodox or became Catholic or so... My point is, it's true of just human beings in general. It doesn't matter the religion. Now here, I'm not boasting about myself. I am nothing without Jesus. I'm nothing without the Holy Spirit. I'm not like that because I was raised in a family that belonged to the Assyrian Church of the East. But then I went to church with Americans to Baptist churches. And then I went to evangelical churches. And now that I'm studying, 
I'm very open to the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Coptic Church, because I see beauty, I see truth, I see God in all of these churches, and I listen. I'm no longer fighting. Before, I would have to say, no, you're wrong. You Christian, Orthodox, you're wrong. I'm right. No, I'm right now I'm at a point. Tell me why you believe it. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. And I want to hear it from my heart. Because if you have a perspective of Christianity that's true from the Holy Spirit, I want to know and I want the Holy Spirit to show me. That's why I welcome them to my channel. That's why I allow them to come and speak. For the past week, I've had three different people, one Protestant, one Roman Catholic, one Orthodox, talking about what they believe about the Bible. Go listen to it. They're giving you three different okay. perspectives. The Orthodox perspective of the Bible, Roman Catholic perspective of the Bible, the Protestant perspective. You know why? Because I'm not interested in being right. I want to know the truth. And if one of them is right and I'm wrong, I want to see it by the Holy Spirit and accept it. But unfortunately, not all Christians are like this. Just like not all Muslims are like this. Just like not all yes. Hindus are like this. Just like not all Jews are like this. But you and me, we're going to be different. We're going to say, God Almighty, now that you're convinced that the Father, the Holy Spirit is God, your prayer is, Holy Spirit, I'm a baby in your hands. You are my teacher. You are my God. You are my Lord, my love, my life, my Savior. You provide for me. You protect me. You preserve me. I give you my soul. I entrust my life to you. You guide me into all truth and save me from error. I am yours. And my mind is open to your truth. And watch him guide you. And, me. and he's going to guide you all the way to Jesus in heaven and glory. So trust in the Holy Spirit, not in me, and not me. in any human teacher. But that's why you're here because the Holy Spirit is bringing you. He's bringing you. Okay, he's putting in your heart. Listen to this man. Listen to that man. Call this man. Who do you think put into my heart yesterday to start a live stream, which I wasn't supposed to? I don't do li late live streams. I did it because some guy was challenging me on the Trinity. The Spirit did that because he was bringing you to call me to answer your questions so I can start a relationship with you and guide you. And then the Holy Spirit's going to take you somewhere else. Because I'm not your teacher. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. The Holy Spirit is pleased yes. to use me now, but later he's going to use someone else. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't need me. I need him. And he chooses which teacher to use to reach the person that he wants to be reached. So God has honored me. The Holy Spirit says, Sam, I'm going to give you the honor. You're going to teach this young man. And you're going to hear him confess Jesus as Lord. But when you're done with him, I'm not done with him. He's in my hands. He belongs to me. I'm going to take him somewhere else. So enjoy your journey, my brother. Enjoy it. Because this journey is going to take you to the feet of Jesus. And you know what Jesus is going to say when he sees you? He's going to look at you. What? My brother, this is from the Bible. He's going to look at you. And he's going to smile at you. And then you're going to an ex experience a love and a joy from him that words cannot de describe. That's beyond understanding. And as he floods you in his love, you're going to see that beautiful face smiling and saying to you, well done, good and faithful servant. It's time for you to enter your rest. Come home. It's time for you to rest now. That's what you're going to hear. Because Jesus is alive. He's not dead. And he loves you. And he will be with you every step of the way. And I know because I've been through hell, my, my brother, because of children of Satan. Slandering me, trying to destroy me, throwing me in jail unjustly for crimes I didn't commit, but because of the wicked sins of others. And every moment Jesus was with me and he hasn't abandoned me and he will never abandon me. And he will never abandon you because he loves you more than you can know. And this is his promise in Hebrews 13 verse 5. Never will he leave you. Never will he forsake you. And then verse 6 says, I'm sorry, Hebrews 13, 5 to 7. I want you to read Hebrews 13, 5 to 7. Then it says this. So we say with confidence. So we say with confidence. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do against me? Let me repeat again. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do against me? Do you know why? Because Jesus says in Hebrews 13, verse 5. Never will I leave Hebrews you. Is, sorry, sorry, go ahead. 
Never will I leave is, you. Is, never is like Hebrews Hebrews Hebraniyin? Yeah, Hebrani, that, uh, Hebrani, 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 Hebrani. Yep, Hebrews. Okay. And let me repeat it and so which, you can end it with this. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And then in verse 6, he says, and 7 talks about those leaders that you look, look up to and emulate. 6, he's telling you, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. What can man do against me? Hebrews 13, verses 5 to 6. And it's interesting because in verse 7, you know what he mentions? Look up to those leaders, those leaders who have set an example for you to follow. Interesting. And then verse 8, you know how it ends it? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning, he does not change. The same God that was there who blessed Peter and loved Peter and restored Peter in gentleness is the same God who's still there now who will bless you and love you and restore you in gentleness. And the same God who continues to... My computer froze on that. So say, Sorry about that. We're buffered. It's the same God who will raise up leaders. For you to follow their example. Same God. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6 and 7, 8. So remember that, brother. Now, if you have a question or two, feel free Thank to ask you. me. I'm still here. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to apologize because every time you mention a book's name in English, I try to think of what it is in Arabic. Yeah, but because, I need it, yes. you know, I, it's not that I don't know them in English. It's just that I want to know this in Arabic as well or even better because I don't see people like you making making video responses that are that are comprehensively yes. defensive you got it look you know, for so I if want you to can, take these ideas find Sorry. rashid rashid r-a-c-h-i-d and abuna zakaria they are christian lions who do it in arabic rashid r-a-c-h-i-d was a former muslim who's a christian his entire shows okay. are in arabic only in arabic only in Arabic. Okay. Let me find it for you. So you think you're you're blessed now. Wait till you listen to him and Abuna Zakaria in Arabic. Let me find it for you. Let me see if I can find it. Here it goes. Okay. Yep. Uh, it's uh, Brother Rashid channel. Let's find it. Let me get it for you. It's all Arabic, brother. All Arabic. Here it is. Taste of Jannah. Jesus is Jannah, not Muhammad's Jannah. Here it is for you. All Arabic. Okay. Now you're not going to sleep all night. Watch. Watch here. It goes right here. You got it there? I sent you the link. I did. I did. I That's see it. it. Rashid. I see it. This guy. He used to be a former Muslim. He's now a Christian. And he serves Jesus. And it's all Arabic. Teaching the Bible. Exposing Islam. Arabic to your heart's desire. And then look for Father Zakaria. Abuna Zakaria. Zakaria Butros. Abuna Zakaria. Okay. Yeah. He's also in Arabic. He's a Coptic Christian priest. Used to be. He's retired. But don't forget, brother. There it is. You've got the resources. And they're reaching Muslims too. Any other questions, my brother? Yes. Um, there's. I was I was having a discussion with a, a Muslim about about Jannah. And I was just, you know, I was just pointing out how how materialistic it is. And then they said, Well, what would you rather be? Would you rather would you rather just sing hymns and worship yeah. all day? And I said, I'm not really quite sure on that. So I just wanted to, you know, here's ask my, because, you know, here's his my point is, them. okay, you know, I'd rather have this materialistic thing than to just be, you know, mindlessly singing hymns all okay, well, day. Well, here, here's my answer to them. You're saying that sexual orgies, because that's what it is, an orgy, in paradise is the greatest feeling and sensation even greater than being in the presence of Jesus, who is the source of infinite love and joy, will flood you in his love and presence. So you're telling me sexual orgies will give you greater satisfaction and joy than being in the presence of an infinitely beautiful God, who's the source of infinite love and joy and peace. So then your presence, he floods you in his love, a love that's beyond description. Seriously, that's how sick and perverted you are? That's that's what they said. So then I responded with, okay, so don't you sing, sing Nasheed right now? So you just go sing Nasheed to the flower virgins later? Yeah. That's it? You just want to sing Nasheed here? and That's it? And, that's yeah. your joy? So I just... The flowering woman? <laughs> that's, 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 the, that's, that's your heart's desire? The flowering women for all eternity? And that's supposedly the greatest joy or the highest joy, the highest level of joy? Now, smart Muslims say, no, 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 no. We're going to see Allah too. He's going to appear here and there. He's going to show up here and there. And yeah. that's the highest. They even say that's the highest joy. That's the highest fulfillment when you see your Lord. Okay, wait. So you're admitting 
seeing the Lord is the highest level of joy and peace and love and satisfaction and fulfillment. Yes. Will sex compare to that? Absolutely not. That's what we're telling you. The joy of paradise is that Jesus Christ, the God-man, God in the flesh, God the Father, will be with us on earth in their presence, being flooded in their infinite love and joy, no greater satisfaction, no greater ecstasy, no greater joy and peace can be imagined than being flooded in their presence, in their love, and their joy. Sex will be nothing in comparison. You won't even be thinking about sex, but because they're perverted, like Muhammad, everything is physical. I, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't quite understand the argument, but yeah. let me but let so, me give you so some verses for saying, that. Sorry, let me give you some verses for I'm that. Sorry. Go to Romans fourteen, verse seventeen. Romans fourteen, verse seventeen. What did Paul say? The you kingdom said of God, Rumia, right? Yeah, Rumia. If you go to Romans fourteen, seventeen, okay. it says, "For the king God is not eating and drinking; it's not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit." Right there, Romans fourteen, seventeen. You see it? Yes. And then go to Luke 20, 34 to 36. Luke 20, verses 34 to 36. There it tells you that when you attain the resurrection, Yom al Qiyamah, the day of resurrection, you will be like angels. You will neither marry nor be given in marriage. You'll be like angels who never die, so you don't need to have sex and procreate. Jesus said it. There is no marriage. There is no sex in the age to come. Because true joy, true peace, true love comes from being flooded in the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever and ever, being in their presence forever. So does that mean that you don't have your family anymore? Or is it that they're, they're no. your family, but it's not in that sense? No, of course you're going to know that was my mother, that was my brother, that was my sister, that was my wife. But I don't need to have sex with my wife for her to be my wife. Here, yes. Because you know what the highest level of marriage is? And this is why marriage failed. Let me share some with you, brothers. The highest level of marriage. Okay. The reason why marriage fail on earth and people don't succeed is because the highest satisfaction that they have is sex. But after a while, sexual intimacy doesn't do it anymore. You get tired of it. So if your relationship is based just on sex, you're going to end up in divorce with someone else and then divorce them with someone else because the highest, highest level and achievement in marriage is when the both of you become the best of friends and just love the other person for who they are being in their presence. When you can get to that level, your marriage becomes unbreakable because after all, when you're in your 70s, you can't have sex. That means what? It's over? I see. Halos, your mother's doing it wrong because she gave birth to a dog like you. Shut your foaming mouth before I muzzle you. Don't be a text warrior who thinks you can do better. Shut up and go evangelize and win some people, you loser. Sorry, brother. We got some dogs that are barking. We got to muzzle them for Christ. You get my point? I do. I do. So then when you, you since you mentioned uh, that day Nuna, the, the judgment, I guess they Nuna means, yes, yes. I think. So in this, in that, in that, in that second coming. So does it, so is there the, does, does the Sharia get established like the old times? I, I was, I tried to read up on that, but I was a little confused. You mean when, like when Jesus he comes and reigns? Okay. When it depends. I mean, when Jesus comes and judges the living and the dead and throws the dead in hell, right? Or before that, doesn't he come and reign for a thousand yeah, years? Yeah, that's or? the thing. That's another passage that some Christians think it's spiritual, meaning he's reigning in heaven for the thousand years. Others say physically on earth. Now, let's take the view that says he's going to reign a thousand years physically on earth. So you have to be careful who you're learning from because not all Christians agree on the thousand years. So I have to be honest, let you know, just like you have different opinions even among Muslims about you know, Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal, the Mahdi, and Isa. But in yes. the Bible, when Revelation says a thousand years, in the Bible you'll find it uses a lot of numbers, but not always what they say literally, symbolically. It's symbol. Like the, like number the seven. 70s times seven? Yeah, see, exactly. So Now, if we say that Jesus is going to reign on earth for a thousand years, you're going to be reigning under the law of Jesus, his rules, his commands, not 
the Sharia of Moses, his laws, his commands, what he says you can and cannot do. Right? Okay. It's Jesus. Okay. He's reigning. Yes. It's his rule, his law, his commands, because he's the king, not Moses. He's the king. Yes. So yes. the king will tell you, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is how you just, this is, he's going to decide for the thousand years. Now, what's more important is after the thousand years, then there is the resurrection of all the dead. Then there's the judgment. Those who rejected Christ are sent to everlasting destruction. Those who have believed in Christ, they will live forever with him in an earth that's now transformed. This earth will be changed so that we won't experience what we experience now. Floods, tsunamis, earthquakes, tornadoes, um, diseases, viruses, none of that anymore. None of that. And not only none of that, we will never physically die. We will never experience pain. We will never cry again. We're going to live in a perfect earth, free of all pain, all disease, all death, all sadness. We're just going to be filled with the love and joy and peace of Christ forever and ever. And we won't need to be sexually intimate to enjoy one another. We're going to enjoy one another just because we are in each other's company. Just because you're with me and I'm with you, that will be joy in itself. Just that you're there and I'm with you. Enjoying your, your company and you enjoying my company as we enjoy the company of God. Okay. So then, so then, okay. So then if, if, if the, if the real scripture would really refer to flowing rivers of honey and virgins and there all is. that, then why would the evil, evil Paul and then end up and, and all the others, the, the ones that are writing corrupt this so right. that it, so that it becomes so much more pure yeah. and so much, you know, you answer I, you notice it? Usually Satan makes something dirty, perverted, and corrupt and evil, right? Yes. So if Paul was evil and corrupt, like you said, if that so-called evil Paul was really an agent of Satan, why did he make heaven beautiful, pure, and righteous, in contrast to Muhammad who made heaven, paradise, a whorehouse, like Playboy Mansion? Yes. You answered it, see? Paul is the one who's pure and righteous. Muhammad is the filth and the scum of the devil. In fact, if you compare the teachings of Paul with Muhammad, Muhammad fails even the test of Paul. He doesn't even come close to Paul, let alone Paul's Lord, Jesus Christ. I'll, I'll look in, I'll look more into that. And then the, the other one that I also had an observation of is, okay, if the, if the Jews corrupted their Torah, then why did it make it so that they, they can't have the, I mean, the sexual yeah. slavery part? Right. You, you're asking why it. take yeah. it away if it was if that was if that was really how it's always meant to be but if it's that if it's that the Quran comes and then it and then it, it abrogates some things and why did it come up with something that's so much cr more cruel and and just more barbaric hundred percent it that, that don't doesn't add up it just doesn't add up brother you're answering yourself Satan is the one who makes something filthy corrupt evil and justifies it gives an excuse for it like what Muhammad did Let's do muta and give an excuse for it. Let's rape married captive women and give an excuse for it. Let me lust for my adopted son's wife and give it. That's Satan. Satan. Satan is the one who will promote evil and fifth filth and immorality and give a justification, an excuse for it. And yet what you find in the Old Testament and what you find in Paul and others is the emphasis on holiness, purity, Pure, unconditional love and sacrifice. Sacrifice yourself for the other without expecting something in return from someone. So in other words, I should be willing to die for you and not expect anything from you because I already got everything from Jesus and I'm doing it for Jesus, not for you and what you can give me. That's pure, right? And I'll just give okay, you one yes. teaching of Paul. Just one teaching of Paul. One, to show you that Muhammad is... In comparison to Jesus, he looks like the, uh, the scum of the earth. In comparison to Paul, who's but a slave of Jesus, Mama looks like the scum of the earth. Let me show you what Paul says about men and women and marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5, if you can turn there. 1 Corinthians 7, okay. verses 1 to 5. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. Okay. 
If you look at it, Paul says, if you can have the gift of not getting married, don't get married so you can devote yourself completely to God. But he goes, I know not everyone has this gift and some of you may be burning. Now notice what he says. If you're burning, then each man should have his own wife. Each woman should have her own husband. Notice, just like a woman can only have one husband, a man can only have one wife. Each man his yes. own wife, each woman her own husband. So if she can only have one husband, a man can only have one wife. But then notice what he says. He goes, woman, your body is not yours. It belongs to your husband. And husband, your body is not yours. It belongs to your wife. Can you show me something like that in the Quran? No, I can only show you the first part. Exactly. You're going to show me in the Quran in chapter 2, Surat al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 223, where it says, your wives said, are your field, them. your tilth, plow into them. Notice the difference between Paul and Muhammad and Muhammad's God. Paul says, husband, that's not your body. You don't own it. Own it. Your wife owns your body like you own her body. And then he says, do not deny each other. In other words, if your wife wants to be intimate, you better be intimate. Don't deny her. And if the husband, can you show me where the Quran says that about husband, do not deny your wife? It doesn't. It doesn't. And then I know, I remember the part in the Hadith where it says the angels will curse her exactly. till, till the, the day. Yeah. Exactly. You see it? And then he I, says, I, 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 the only yeah. time husband and wife agree not to be intimate is if they agree to it for prayer and fasting. So I come to my wife and say, sweetie, Let's fast and pray for three days and no sex. But he says, don't make it too long, lest you be tempted by the devil and sin. Because if we then do it, let's say, for 30 days, then I may start lusting and committing sin in my heart. And then I then will defeat the purpose. Because if I have evil desires, then my fasting and prayer becomes of no use. So it has to be mutual agreement. Honey, do you agree we fast and pray for three days, no sex? Sure. But only three days. Don't make it too long where she starts lusting and you start lusting, committing zinna in your heart, and then your prayer and fasting becomes void. Can you show me such a command in Muhammad's Sharia? I don't know of any. You won't find it. In fact, just to repeat it for the Christians who are listening, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 223, it says to the men, your wives are your field. Plow into them the way you want. Your wives are your field. Plow into them the way you want. And if you go to the Hadith, the narrations, Christians, according to the Hadith, this was revealed, supposedly, quote-unquote, when there were Muslim men from Mecca that migrated, migrated to Medina, and they wanted to sleep with women in a certain sexual position, and the women didn't want to because they're not used to it. So they said, no. We don't want you to do it. In fact, the Hadith says from behind. I'm not lying. It says from behind. And they go, no, 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 no. We're not used to that here. You don't do that to us. So the verse came down saying, hey, you have no choice. You are the field of your husband. He can enter you through the front or behind. Live with it. That's what Allah and his messenger said. That's what Allah and his messenger said. I think that I think though the the the, the tafsir would say that like it, the, 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 it would it would put a, draw a red line there. I think some do the tafsir. Does. Yes, but no, even okay. from behind. But I know I don't want to get graphic behind, but in the vaginal yeah. area. Yes, but there are some narrations yes. that says it's even anal, and there was a debate. In Shia, yeah. yeah, no, no. There's yeah. even in Sa Sunni oh, tradition, but they say it's daif, brother, daif. But there are Sunni traditions. That says behind means not just, I'm sorry guys, it's, I, I have to be graphic because this is a filthy, satanic, disgusting religion. It says from behind but through the vagina. Others say no, anal, but then others say no, those are weak and it's forbidden. That's in the Sunni, not the Shia. I have the Hadith in my articles. Daif, brother, okay. daif. It's weak, brother. Okay. But either, even if it's from behind through the vag 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 vaginal area, I'm trying to be G-rated, guys. Still notice the women were telling the men, no, we don't like that position. And Allah's messenger didn't say, respect them. Don't force them. Hey, you're his field. If he wants to do it, do it. Shut up. That's what chapter 2, verse 223 says. That's in the Quran. Not making it up. Yes, I remember being like eight years old and I read it. And I'm like, what? It, it is very... 
I was very disappointed, but I couldn't say it and I couldn't express it because, you know, this is the most holy text and, and, and then it's just, it's, it's just randomly in there. And, and, you know, I just stumble upon it and I was like, I don't want to know anything about this. Exactly. But that's, but you see the difference between yeah. Paul, right? I do, I do. And and also another observation I have is I know not every book is in the chronological order, but when you start, you do have a sense of, 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 of time, how it how it passes. But then when you start the Quran, like in the third page, the first verse you read, it just starts to say, well, the belief the, 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 the unbelievers, even if you tell them or don't tell them, they're still gonna be unbelievers. Allah made them deaf and blind exactly. and all that. And I'm like I don't have any sense of flow of time. Things like things crash into each other. This story starts here and then it ends here and something else goes. It's just, it's, it's very unorganized. It's almost like somebody just randomly put this here and this there. And I don't know. I don't really see it. I don't see the, the, the miracle in there. Brother, but, the miracle you know. is the miracles that Muslims actually think it's a miracle. That's the miracle that they think it's a miracle. <laughs> By the way, brother, they want to invite you. They're telling you they're praying yeah. for you. They love you. But there is a feature called Discord. Discord, some of the Christian brothers and sisters that I teach that are here, they go there, they meet with each other, and they fellowship with each other, and they pray. It's a private thing. So I can give you the link if you want to okay. go there. Yeah, so the daydream, send me the link. I'll okay, send it to you. Okay, I'm not following with the uh, I'm not following up with the live stream, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah. What what it is? It's I, I, Discord. I, I, you can go on any time. They, it's a chat. It's like a place where you gather to chat, but it's private. The Christians are there. Yeah. There, I go there sometimes. Other Christians go there. There were Muslims who became Christian, and so there they can help you if you have questions or pray for you. You can have a private name. Just say, "Hey, I'm the guy that Sam was talking to on his YouTube session. I'm the guy who became Christian." They'll bring you in, and if you have questions there or you want them to pray, they'll be your family to help you grow. When I'm not around. They'll always be around because they're there every day. So they're going to give you the link. I'll send it to you. No, you don't I have to go. That. If you don't want to go, you don't have to go. But I'm just going to give you the link anyway. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I would love that. Do you have any more questions, bro? And I, and I know you. I know you. You've been you've been talking to me for for a long time, and I I I, I really appreciate all of that because I I came in with a few questions, and the last one I had was in the book of Hosea. I think that's Hosea. 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 Yeah, Hosea. Hosea. Is Hosea okay. Yes. That would be. How, how do you say it in English? Hosea or Hosea. I say it Hosea. Some people say Hosea. Hosea. Okay. Okay. It's 1316. That one comes up a lot, and I just don't know any context behind it. Like yes. there are others, like the one, like the, the, the Mazmur 137. I know that one oh, yeah. doesn't really say go grab your babies and smash yeah. them with rocks. Yeah. But, you know, they take all these things, and I don't really have any context behind them. And so, what are they? What are they trying to say about this passage that Samaria became just, just, Yeah, yeah, brother. Here's the problem with the, with the Muslims. They kill me when they say this. When you read passages, it's right here, Hosea thirteen sixteen. Samaria shall become desolate, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their woman with child shall be ripped open. See, this is what kills me about the Muslims. They act as if this stuff doesn't happen every day. Do do women get raped? Do women get raped I mean, in the like world? In life? Is yeah, in life. Fact of life? Yes. Yes. Do children get killed? Yes. Okay. But isn't God in control? Let's say Allah. Isn't he in control? Yes. Can he stop it? Yes, but then, but Why then doesn't, he doesn't stop that it? interfere with free will? But how many times he's interfered with free will? Hasn't he interfered with people's free choices and stopped them from doing something like that when they wanted to kill Muhammad? Did he interrupt their free will and stop them from killing Muhammad? No, he didn't. Then how did he stop them from killing? Muhammad? I'm sorry, he, no, he, he didn't. Wait, he, did he interfere? I don't think yes. so. Did he? How many times did they try to assassinate Muhammad? They couldn't do it. For example, the night when Muhammad left, who did he put in his bed to deceive the kuffar that they thought that Muhammad was in the bed? Ali, right? Was that Ali? Yes, yes. yes. And then, according to yeah, the Muslim remember, fairy tale, the Muslim fairy tale, when Muhammad and Abu Bakr were in the cave and the Meccans pursued him. Didn't supposedly a spider spun a web? So they thought that... Yes. Okay, so who's interfering with these decisions to stop them from killing Muhammad? I'm just arguing for argument's sake. So it's, it's Allah. Okay, yeah. so what's my point? 
Since the Muslim believes God is in control, he can stop people from sinning. He can stop people from doing their evil acts. That means they're in the same boat I am, same boat I am, that they have to admit God is allowing these things to happen. So when you read in Hosea 13, 16, Samaria is Israel. When people come and rip pregnant women open, that's a fact of history. This is just an archaeological fact. That's what the ancient peoples did. The Babylonians did it. Other people did it. When they would enter, they would rip pregnant women open and rape the women. That's what they did. So what God is saying is, because of your sin, I'll no longer protect you. I'm going to remove my hand of protection and let them come and do the evil they want to do. But if you were obeying me, I would not let them get near you and touch you. Did you read the context? Why is this happening? Let's read it again. Samaria shall be okay. become desolate for she has rebelled against her God. What has she done? She rebelled. Okay, so what does that mean? That means she's disobeying God, right? Yes. So you, a God that you don't want to have anything to do with, that you hate, you still want him to protect you. Okay, you don't want me? I'm going to remove my hand. Now they're going to come in. The Babylonians will come in. The Assyrians will come in. The Egyptians will come in. They're going to murder your young men. They're going to ro rip open the wombs of pregnant women and rape women. In other words, they're going to do what Muhammad and the Muslims did. Yes. Why? Not because God is the one commanding this evil. It's because God is removing his protection from this evil. See the difference? I do. I do. So, so notice I why, do. though, he's removing his hand. Notice why? Because... They rebel against me. So basically you're saying, God, I don't care for you. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. I don't care for your rules, but still protect me from getting killed by my enemies. God says, no way. You don't want me? Then you don't want my protection. Now you need to take care of yourself and protect yourself. Good job doing that. I see. Okay. So where's the problem? Okay. I see that. I don't see. Okay, now I don't, now I, I don't see it. It's just that, for it's the just Muslim that you know, things the like problem. that are brought up. For the Muslim, well, the I, I, I guess they say they say, oh, we're we're instructed not to, not to attack women or infants or okay. any of that. You're but instructed the, the not to attack. Here. Okay, let me let me go. You're instructed not to attack, but the pagans who don't believe in God, do do you think they're not going to kill your women and children? I see. It's very different because because when they say it, they say we're not instructed to attack um, women and children. That's their instruction from Allah, which says go kill the men. So, so in Hosea there is thirteen sixteen. In this verse, it's talking about yeah. just uh, the consequence that yeah, here, there, that's these what people it is. Do this to you. Samaria is Israel, God's people. He's saying because you rebelled against me, that's what they're going to do to you. So you may not kill women and children, but the pagans who don't care about your deen or your God or your rules, what's going to stop them from killing your women, men, uh, women and children? Yeah. Yes, I see that. They also they 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 like to bring up Ezekiel nine. Uh, yes. Or yeah, Ezekiel nine again, and then, uh, Judges twenty one. Uh, beautiful, I'll say beautiful. In Ezekiel nine, who's the one coming in to slaughter the men and the women and children? The Babylonians. And why are they coming in? Because God is removing His hand of protection. Now, if God protects them, you think the king of Babylon will be able to attack any Jew if He's protecting them? If if He was protecting them, no. So why would the why would then? The women and the men and the children be slaughtered because God is handing them over to punishment. Mark those who believe in me, I'll keep them safe. Those who don't, the sword slaughtered the men and the women and children. Even the end. Why? Because the Bab read it. The book of Ezekiel is all about the Babylonians. The Babylonians are coming to destroy Jerusalem and the temple and murder the men and rape the women and take the children captive. God is saying, I'm going to let them come in. Because you're sinning against me, so I'm not going to stop them or protect you from them. You're going to suffer the punishment of your sin. In fact, I you know see. what's wow. weird? So they, they, oh, so go, ahead. go ahead, brother. Saying you're saying? Oh, I said, wow. They just quote all of this, ad, and they, they misrepresent it so much. And, bro, I don't want they you really to believe my interpretation. Read it. Just read. Just go ahead and read. Read the context. Oh, I, have, I have taken the notes to read them after I asked right. you what you what you say. But you get what I'm trying to say, right? My point is, I do. I just do. read. Now, brother, I want to show you their hypocrisy, okay? I want you okay. to go to Surat al-Isra, okay? okay? Chapter 17. Okay, we're going to read from verse 4 all the way 
We're going to read to 10. Let's just stick with 10. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. This is yes. talking about what I just said. It's not about Ben Israel. Israel and the temple being destroyed. So when the prophet, okay. uh, let me start at four. I'm sorry. Seven chapter 17 verses four to 10. And we decreed for the children okay. of Israel in scripture. This is Allah speaking, right? And he's talking to the children yes. of Israel. And what scripture? Their Torah, right? Uh, yes. Yes. We decreed for the children of Israel in scripture that indeed you would do mischief on the earth twice and you'll become tyrants and extremely arrogant. So when the promise came for the first of the two, we sent against you slaves of ours given to terrible warfare. They entered the very innermost parts of your home, and it was a promise completely fulfilled. Wow. The Quran says what these people did to the Jews, slaughtering their women in their homes, that was Allah's slaves, and he sent them. How come they don't tell you that? Oh, oh yeah, it does say Ibad and Lana. It does say that. So why didn't the Muslims quote to you chapter 17, verses 4 to 10, that says, it was Allah who sent them as his slaves to enter the homes of the Bani Israel to kill them and murder them and rape them as punishment. Wow, Muslims, how come you don't quote your book to show, show me that your book is agreeing with my Bible? But then does it, does it, uh, do they both agree that it's Ibad and Lana? No. Nope. It's, it's, well, in a one way, Ibadun. yes. Yeah, okay. In one way, let me correct it. Nope, not like this way. That my, One way, yes, because Nebuchadnezzar is called God's servant and Cyrus. What does that mean, servant? Meaning they're doing what God is allowing them to do. So in that sense, they are servants, right? Meaning okay. they're under my control. They're my creatures. I can stop them, kill them, or allow them to do what they do. So in a sense, you can say, yes, Nebuchadnezzar is a slave of God. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar, who created Nebuchadnezzar? God. Who's giving life yes. to Nebuchadnezzar? God. Who's allowing Nebuchadnezzar to be king and to conquer his enemies? God. So in that sense, he is a slave. So here in the Bible, when it says slave, meaning that Nebuchadnezzar cannot do what he does and cannot rule if I don't allow him to and give him power to rule. But that's my point. God doesn't make anyone sin or rape or murder. That's what people do out of their evil heart. God will stop you from doing it or allow you to do it. So if you're righteous in the sign of God, he'll protect you from the evil desires of the shayateen, the satans, or the human beings who want to do it. He'll stop you. But if you disobey him and if you resist him, he goes, you know what? I remove my hand of protection. Come on in. But now put that aside. Here, according to the Quran... The Quran teaches Qadr. It doesn't just teach Allah allows. Allah predestines. But even if they don't want to... So the predestination is exclusive to their theology? Their view. There are Christians, like there are Muslims. Again, just like with this, uh, Christianity. In Islam, you have those who teach free will and those who teach predestination. Even in Christianity, those who teach free will, predestination. The difference is, if you read the Quran and the Sunnah, and I have an article on it, Muhammad was predestination all the way. All the way. And it did way. say that there is a hadith about Adam and Musa yes. talking to each other. And then why did you eat the apple? And he said, Allah made me you, do it. Would you say, I would, yeah, Allah, okay. Allah so wrote Muhammad, that it would happen. Muhammad in the sunnah, predestination. In the Bible, there are verses that you can use to show predestination. But there are other verses that show that the evil you do and the wickedness you do is not predestined by God. It's things you do out of your own evil heart that God will allow you to do, but he doesn't make you do. That's not Islam. That's not Sunni Islam. That's not Muhammad. That's not the Hadith. But even let's put that aside. Let's forget it. Let's just agree the Quran agrees with the Bible, right? Okay. okay. Yeah, exactly, truth defenders. That's what I'm talking about. You're calling it predestination, right? I'm calling what you're calling fatalism. I'm calling it predestination. I don't want to confuse the guy, truth defenders. I have a friend here saying predestination, fatalism. You want me to confuse? What you're calling I don't fatalism, I'm calling predestination Islamic style, truth defenders. It's a brother of the Christ. But truth defenders, you're like me. You don't believe God makes people sin. You don't believe God makes people rape anyone. They do it out of their own evil, sinful hearts. So that's why. But I got a guy, brother. He's my friend. With friends like these who yes. needs enemies, he's going to cause me to have a heart attack and meet Jesus sooner than later. But anyway, for you, if you're listening... They have to deal with chapter 17 of the Quran, verse 5. Who sent in the nations into the very homes of the Bani Israel to kill them and murder them and rape them? 
Allah did. So why are they complaining about Hosea? I see. I see. So, or was, I'm sorry, it was Ezekiel, right? Yeah, and it's not even Hosea. Remember you mentioned Hosea 13, 16. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, same same thing. Because Hosea the, is the same in, context. Ezekiel, same context. The Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are fierce. They're brutal people. They have no mercy. They will slaughter and murder and rape and kill unless God stops them and protects you. But you don't want God because you defy God. You disobey God. You dishonor God, and you want other gods. So God says, okay, you don't want me. You don't want my protection. What, you want me to protect you, but you don't want to worship me? How does that work? Yeah, I see. I'll give I you an see. example. Let me give you a human example. A human example because God likens his relationship to his people like a husband and wife. I'm married to a woman. She doesn't find me attractive. She thinks I'm ugly. She won't be intimate with me. She goes and runs after other men. She sleeps with other men, even married men. But she wants me to still pay her bills and feed her and let her sleep in my house. How does that work? Yeah, it doesn't work. So God is saying, you don't want me, then you don't want my protection. Oh, so you want me to protect you and feed you and clothe you and make things nice for you, even though you don't want to worship me, you don't want to submit to me, you don't want to obey my commands. How does that work? Yeah, I see. It does not work. So where's the problem when I you see. interpret it this way? I, I don't I don't see the problem. I, I really I, I, I will read both in their context because people bring them up a lot. And I, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't really know anything about the, the Abu Zakaria or, or Rashid, so oh, I will check, check and see if they've responded to these things. So it just leaves us with, with, with judges. I think it was twenty-one. Yeah. Well, I have an article with and, judges and I, twenty-one. Can, brother, can you okay. show me where it says what they did, the Benjamites, what they did to that concubine, was with God's will that God said, "Do this." I command it, and I, I. Bless it, and it's it, it's pleasing to my heart. This is the one where they chop her up into 12 pieces, or is that yes, the story? Yes, that's one. Here's my article on it. Here it is, okay. because a Muslim brought it up. I'm going to give guys, here's articles on Judges 21 that they bring up where the Benjamites raped a, the concubine of a Levite and left her basically dead and then he dismembered her in 12 parts and those will say what kind of god is this as if god ordered that so guys here's the link to the article i wrote a response to this i'm sending you a link three times so you can save it and i'm sending it to you brother if you read the book of judges you know what the entire book of judges is i mean doesn't it do the highlight all the i mean the bad things that, that they, they did? keep they keep disobeying God, rejecting God, turning their back on God, and God keeps allowing nations come to punish them and beat them, and then they cry out to God, and then God saves them, and then they repeat the pattern over and over again. So let me okay. show you what the Bible says okay. about these men. Here, this is the same book, Judges, right? Can you go to Judges 17, verse okay. 6? Judges 17, verse 6? Se 17, verse 6. Okay. Go there and read. Tell me if the, what they were doing had God's pleasing. It was according to the Sharia of God. Judges, read that for me. In Arabic, you got it, right? In those days, there was... Oh, no, I have it in English because I, I just want to okay. not take up so much of your time. No, so in okay, those bro. days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did which was right in his own eyes. So who told you what they did was pleasing to God? I, looks, that seems to not be. Okay, even the same chapter, Judges 21, the same chapter. Go to Judges 21. 21, okay. Verse 25. Judges 21, verse 25. Okay. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. This is that same chapter, Judges 21. Did they not read verse 25? Well, I, I, you know, with everything that I brought up, it doesn't even look like they know what the book is about or what the context is or anything. They just take this on its own and they just crop it. Okay, now I'm going to give. I'll write these down. It's in my article. I'm going to read it for you. Ready? Okay. Same book. We're okay. just sticking with the book of Judges, right? Okay. Judges 3, verse 12. Look what it says. Judges 3, verse 12. Then the children of Israel, Judges 3, verse 12. Then the children of Israel once more did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They did what was evil in his sight. So the Lord strengthened the king of Eglon of Moab against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So does it say they did what was right or what was evil? It was evil. Okay, Judges chapter 4, verse 1. Notice how many times it's going to say this. Judges chapter 4, verse 1. 
when Ehud was dead, Judges 4 verse 1, the children of Israel once more did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, now again, Judges chapter 6 verse 1, same book, Judges chapter 6 verse 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Now one more, yes. Judges chapter 10 verse 6. Judges chapter 10 verse 6. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshipped the Baals, the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, Sidon, Moab, the Ammonites, and the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord and did not serve him. Now finally, Judges 13 verse 1. Judges 13 verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, brother, repeatedly it says they did what was evil in the sight. They did what was right in their sight, not in the sight of God. So now you're going to quote to me Judges 21 to show, oh, see, God was okay with it. Wow, what a, what a flop in their, in, their, in their ways. See, pitiful what they do to my Bible, right? Yeah. So then, then okay. There's one, one more in my on my notes, which was Jeremiah, which is Jeremiah ten forty eight. Okay. And what which about is like that? Cursed who he doesn't. I, I, you know, they say, oh, you guys talk about peace, and then look here, it says cursed is the man that 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 you know forbids blood from their sword. I don't know how to. What is okay. in English? I'll look it up. Yeah. Even even that again. Does do they know what the story of Jeremiah is or no? Again, we have to go through this. No. It's about God. They don't. About to destroy. The Jews at the hands of the Babel Babylonians because of their sin. In fact, if you read, just just read the book. God is disgusted with the. Sorry, Jews. forty-eight ten, not not ten forty-eight. Sorry, I was I was reading in Arabic. I was reading in Arabic, so I picked took, took the number the opposite oh. way. It's forty-eight ten. Okay, even Sorry, then, it's it's, that makes my case even more. If you read the context, brother, if you just start from the chapter, what is it talking about? It's talking about judgment against his people and other nations for their sins. Okay, they started at 10, right? Okay. Yes. If you start at I'm verse sorry, 1. Uh, yeah, yes. Okay, if, they start, yes. if you start at verse 1. Concerning Moab, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Woe to Nebo, that's a false god, for it be ruined. If you just read the chapter, brother. It's so long, I'm even tired to read it because they disgust me. It's talking about nations whom God is going to punish for their evil, for their idolatry, worshiping gods and goddesses, for their sexual immorality, for murder. And in that context, it says, put salt on Moab, okay, for she shall be laid waste okay. because it's going to be destroyed. Her towns will become desolate with no one to live in them. A curse on anyone who is lax in doing the Lord's work. A curse on anyone who keeps their sword from bloodshed. What's the context? What is he saying, curse? Meaning the time as judgment has come, and now God is going to remove his hand to allow these soldiers and these murderers to come in and slay them. And woe to the man who doesn't slay them to punish them for their wicked sin. I see. So when God allows a nation to punish another nation for their sin, is that evil or is that judgment? Is that justice? No, that's justice. That's what he's saying. These people read it. They're worshiping gods and goddesses, Nebo and Chemash, false gods and goddesses, sexual immorality, murder, rape, incest. Now is time for judgment. I'm tired of their sins. I'm tired of the sins of my people. I'm tired of the sins of the Babylonians. I'm tired of the sins of the Moabites and the Edomites. It's now time for judgment. They have to now suffer for their sins. I won't put up with their wickedness anymore. Why is that wrong? Okay, I don't, yeah, I, I, I see it in that context. That's what I'm wondering. Why is that wrong? Yeah, I, I, I see. Well, you see, yesterday I was I was telling you that I know that there the, the concept of, you know, like the diversification, I think the word you said was, wasn't there. So when now, you know, when you chop off one little part and then you say, here, look, that's terrible, then it's just, it's very much cherry picking. So I'm, you know, yeah. trying to understand that, get used to it. And now, now I'm the, the, the part that, that puzzles me that I want to, to get the answers for, uh, you know, not, I, I know it's, it's a very big question is how do you turn the other cheek and how do you, oh, um, that's, yeah, that's how do you love your enemies and do all that while maintaining law enforcement? And how does like, yeah, you know, a police officer is not going to turn the other cheek yeah, because when somebody's Jesus getting is not talking. See again, brother.
Jesus is not talking to police officers. He's talking about you, his disciple. He's saying you, when someone insults you, you don't pay evil for evil. But he's not talking to police officers, law enforcement, or government. Because the same Jesus also had Paul write Romans 13. That's why you have governments and people with the sword to punish evildoers. You're confusing being a disciple of Jesus and how you treat people who insult you for preaching the gospel with government officials and policemen and soldiers. They're two different categories because you have to distinguish okay. between rules for a disciple who's not a police officer or a soldier in law enforcement or in government and someone who's a Christian who is in government who is a police officer or a soldier or in law enforcement. There's two different contexts. Matthew 5 is talking about okay. the disciples of Jesus who are not soldiers or government officials or law enforcement agencies. It's not a different context completely. If someone insults you, you don't insult them and repay evil with evil. That's a different context. But even then, Jesus didn't mean it literally. You know what I mean? Literally, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, give them the left. You know why I know it's that's not literal? He didn't mean that literally, but it's why? an expression. An expression, Because in John 18, 22 to 23, the servant of the high priest slapped Jesus. Jesus didn't turn the other cheek. He said, if I've spoken the truth, why do you hit me? John 18, 22 to 23. Yes, I remember that. Okay. So is Jesus contradicting himself? No. Okay. Because the the... This is an expression when it says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other. Slapping on the right cheek, culturally, let me explain it because I got to break it down. Culturally, okay. to slap someone on the right cheek, if you're right-handed, if you're right-handed, right? And by the way, I didn't invent this. I heard a scholar who studied the historical cultural context of the first century. This is something because, again, we have documents from the first century giving us an idea of the customs and the practices of that time. If you're right-handed and I slap you on the right cheek, now picture what I'm telling you. I'm right-handed. Okay. How do I slap you with the right cheek? Do I slap you with the palm or the back of my hand? The, if I'm the right back of your hand. Right? In that time, to slap someone with the back of the hand was dis disgraceful and shameful because it's you're saying he's not even worthy to be slapped by the palm. It's like you're slapping him and putting him down like you're beneath me. You know, like, yeah. You, know, you get what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So what Jesus is saying is when someone puts you down, you don't put them down in return. Give them the other cheek. Simply, it's an expression saying, do not put someone down if he puts you down. Do not insult someone if he insults you. Just give him the other cheek. Let, let it be. Let God deal with him. That's a completely different context. If Jesus literally meant if someone physically slaps you, give him the other cheek. Someone backhands you. Then Jesus in John 18, 22 to 23 did not practice what he preached because when the servant of the high priest slapped him, he didn't give him the other cheek. He told him, why did you hit me? Okay. So this is simply an expression saying, anyone who puts you down, don't put him down. Don't stoop to their level. Okay. Okay. Exactly, Richard. Thank okay. you, brother. You say eye for okay, an eye? I no, see. you don't eye for exactly. So you got to thank you, brother. You gave for me. So you just you get the point. That's all it means. But that's not. It's not talking about government officials and soldiers and law enforcement. That's a different context. Because even Peter, when he converted Cornelius in Acts chapter ten, Acts ten, Cornelius is a Roman soldier, and he's the leader of one hundred soldiers. He's a centurion. When he converts to the gospel. Peter doesn't say to him, okay, now you can't be a soldier. You can't be ahead of a hundred soldiers. You have to stop that. Never told him that because that's a different context. Okay. Okay. Are you with me there or am I, am I confusing you? I, I am. No, no, I am. I am. It's, it's, I, I, I got the answer, which mean, makes a lot of sense. I should have, I should have put in more thought. And, and more research to no, that because okay. it came no, off no. as a That's why you're here. Question. No, it's not a stupid No, it's not a stupid question. How are you going to learn if you don't ask and seek? So I'm answering. And I'm going to give you final proof that Jesus' teaching has nothing to do with law enforcement, policemen, or government officials or protection 
from law enforcement agency. I'll prove it to you. Acts 23, 12 to 23. Acts 23, 12 to 23. When you write that, write it down, read it at your own leisure. Acts 23, 12 to 23. It says a group of Jews had taken an oath. They will not eat or drink until they kill Paul. They had sworn, right? Okay, that's okay. Acts 23, 12 to 23. Paul tells his nephew, his sister's son, go tell the guard that the Jews have made an oath that they're going to kill me. When the guard found out, because Paul was a citizen of Rome, he was a citizen of Rome, they commanded 200 soldiers to guard him, 200 soldiers armed with swords, knives, that if anyone tried to kill Paul, they would kill them at the spot. So if Jesus was against law enforcement, police agency, and seeking the protection of policemen, then Paul is in violation of the rules of God, and we know he's not. I see. I will I will take the time to read it. See? Why is Paul allowing 200 soldiers to defend him and kill anyone who tries to make an attempt on his life? Because it's your God-given right, given to you by God, to try to preserve your life and the life of your loved ones from being killed and being harmed by those who seek to kill you. That's a completely different context from Jesus talking to disciples. If I preach the gospel and someone says, hey, you fat slob, you fat ass, you, you know, I don't say, well, no, you know what? Your mother's a fat ass. You fat. No, I say, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Okay. Ignore it. When do you get zealous? When someone insults Jesus. When someone mocks Jesus. When someone blasphemes Jesus. When someone mocks the Bible. That's different. Then I can say, you filthy, wicked dog, you son of Satan. You filthy whore of the devil. How dare you mock my Lord and blaspheme my Lord? But when it's personal, they insult me, laugh. Oh, I'm fat. Thank you. I'm glad at least you don't want to ask me out. You sure you don't ask me out? I'm not attractive. Don't you like big fat people? See the difference? <laughs> I do. I do. I do. So well, that, that pretty much answers every single thing I thought of the entirety of the day. So I, I, I'm i extremely, extremely thankful for Anytime, this because really. I've looked and looked and I needed my answers to let go of what, what I was believing for a long time. So, you know, thank you once again. Anytime. I will always be tuning in and, and uh, to... Um, to, to end this, I guess I, I, I want to say glory to the triune God. Amen. I do believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And to, 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 to say this in Arabic too. Amen, amen, amen. And, and don't forget, brother, and, this is now saved on my YouTube okay. channel. You can go back and listen to it. Okay, yes, I did that with yesterday's session and I took oh. down the notes and I will listen and take down notes one more time. And I mean, I, 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 I owe you. So thank you. Thank you. You don't so owe me, brother. Everything I have is from Jesus and it's the gift of Jesus to you. The only thing you do is you pray for me and my daughters that Jesus will protect us and use me to glorify him and love him till I die so that you and I will be together with Jesus forever. You owe me nothing. My life belongs to Jesus and I'm your servant, your servant for the sake of Jesus. So thank him. Thank you, thank you, Sam, and thank you, Jesus, for being the bread of life. That's one thing that just that just shook me to my core. So, so. Lord be with you. We love you, brother. Thank I'll you, talk Sam. To you soon. Thank you. Have a good night, Sam. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Bye. God bless you. Too. Thank you. Now we got someone else. We got this rabid. Uh... Yeah, we got another rabid anti-trinitarian dog. Do you want me to call him? You guys want me to finish off this rabid anti-Trinitarian dog? An anti-Trinitarian. It may not last long, guys. It may not last long because he may be barking and talking over me, so I'm going to just probably block him. So, guys, let's make it an all-nighter. Hey, what the heck? So pray. Let's see. Another another demon, agent of the devil. Let's see if he picks up. Let's try. 
He should be on. It says he's on. He was trying to interrupt me as I was talking to him, so I ignored him. These guys. They look. Man, we've been here for over 300, uh, three hours. We had close to 300. We still got 210. Man, you guys don't like to sleep either, huh? So much for my walk. I was going to go walk today. Let's see. Hopefully it'll pick up. Is it, I know it's going to be quick. Hold on. I don't want to leave without ending because this guy's going to. It's going to be one of these guys. Anti-Trinitarian thinks he's a Christian. These guys disgust me. These are the ones that are dangerous, not the Muslims, who claim to be Christian, and yet they pervert the Bible to their shame and destruction by preaching a false Jesus. He's on, too. It says he's on. So I don't know why he's not picking up. Yeah, over three hours, dude. How many people are going to watch this? How, who's going to watch three hours, guys? You guys going to watch? Uh, who's going to go up? But, you know, I think people will watch it because we've answered so many questions on so many topics. And I'm trusting Jesus that he anointed me to speak accurately and clearly and destroy any error I made and destroy my forgetfulness for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, the first person that called on my YouTube channel and gave his life to Jesus Christ from a Muslim background. Yeah, I don't want to hang up until this guy calls me, man. I want to really deal with this guy because I'm going to block him soon because they're not going to last long. These guys, these guys are more dangerous. These anti-Trinitarians who claim to be Christians who follow the Bible, they're the ones who are dangerous. You need to put them in their place until they repent. If they don't repent, then you destroy their arguments and shame them for the glory of Jesus because they're going to deceive Muslims into following a false god that they think is the god of the Bible. So they're more wicked, more dangerous, more demonic than a Shibra Ali. Okay. Did you guys enjoy overall the discussion? Did you guys enjoy the answers? A lot of subjects, right? So here's what you guys do for me. You know it has to be the grace of God's spirit, the grace of God's spirit to enable me and to perfect my ability to recall passages on any subject off the cuff. You know that's not me. It's not me. So people say, what do you do to memorize? I don't. Early on, I realized by the grace of God's spirit that the Lord had given me the grace and the gift to recall verses. So now here's what you need to do. Ask the Holy Spirit to perfect that ability in me that I never lose that ability. But he perfects it so I can be stronger in that gift, use it more perfectly, more powerfully to bring Jesus glory. Ask the Spirit to make me more holy, more righteous, more pure, more in love with Jesus, more obedient for the health I need to bless my daughters, to give them health abundantly, provision and salvation. Bring them to me and for the provision, do it for the glory of the Chime God, Father, Son, and Spirit. I can't reach Wali Chabad. I don't know where he's at. Right? You know that's the Lord that can enable me to recall verses on variety of topics off the cuff. That's the testimony of how almighty, how real the Holy Spirit is. And I pray that I just yield completely to the Spirit more and more. And I pray that for all of us. What do you want Skype for, CJ? I'm not here to answer your question unless you're trying to challenge me. Then it won't be long. You don't care, right, CJ? It's about you. I just did three hours. But, hey, who cares about Sam? It's all about me. CJ, he owns the world. That's right. I just want to see if this guy's going to pick up because I don't want to go to sleep and then he calls me. If not, we're going to sh shut down and I'll do it in the morning. Don't forget, guys, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Osama Dokdok is going to be live with me on the errors and contradictions in the Quran. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing. All right, I don't think he's going to pick up even though he's online. Yeah, he's not picking up. All right. I was hoping to deal with him now, but we'll see. Maybe he'll call in the morning. So be on the alert. Maybe later in the morning, the coward will have the courage to defend his satanic God 
and hopefully he'll repent. Pray for him that Chewbacca, his name is Chukwa. I'll call him Chewbacca, that he'll be convicted and repent of his false god and fear Jesus. If not, I'm going to muzzle him and send him on his merry way. So he's not showing up. All right, guys. I hope you're blessed. Do pray for me. Pray for this young man. Pray the Lord Jesus will strengthen him. He'll grow in love with Jesus and never turn away. Do covenant and pray and fast for my daughters and I. My Sarai and Zippor, I've not seen them over a year. Pray God will keep them away from Martin, that filthy dog, and their unrepentant, godless mother, Michelle, so that she fears the Lord and does not allow another man in their lives so they can be with me. I can raise them and love them. Pray for their health, their salvation, their provision. Pray for my health, salvation, and provision. That Christ will get me more holier for his glory. Okay? We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Vargas, you ask a lot for nothing, huh? Vargas, can you give me your bank account? Here, Vargas, Acts 2.38. Let me give you this article. Can you give me your credit card bank account? Because you want a lot for nothing. You little self-centered, selfish little... Anyway, I'm kidding. Vargas, here's the article on Acts 2.38. Here it is, guys. Acts 2.38. Okay, one more time, man. Let's see. Maybe maybe he won't. If not, I'll, I'll end it. Hold on, let's see. Okay, not that. Pray that the Holy Spirit will perfect me, that it'll destroy my forget forgetfulness, crucify my flesh, perfect me to recall these passages and live them out for the glory of Jesus. Okay, if not, we're going to hang up. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Maranatha. Father, Son, Spirit, we love you. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Seal us by the Spirit and cause us to trust in you more. You alone are God. Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, he's gone, guys. Take care. He's not picking up. Take care, guys.